What? For, for I, I think our county office. Uh-huh. And I put this down. Will you see this down here? Nope. I'm not. much as we can. Uh, and is it on Washington Street? Yeah. Okay. It's on Washington Avenue. And they're close to the entrance to the cemetery. There's a log, mm -hmm. there's a patio connect behind the restaurant and a garden behind this house. This is not commercial property, patio is. Okay. And we're all happy with that. And uh, it's, 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 it's just home to us. I mean, we've been, we've been here, for, at, when our kids were growing, were growing up, uh, we lived at 2507 Patania, it's on the corner of second, the house they're replacing right now. And my children grew up there. Well, we don't have to go to my first No, that's there. interesting. The house that they're, that's now a vacant lot? No. Okay. They are now restoring a game. Okay, okay. Uh, and they, they, the last person that owned it had put in a swimming pool in where the garden on the mm, left side of the house, the up-down side of the house. And these people nicely took it down and are restoring the garden. Oh, good. And it'll be, uh, we just so happy to see them doing as much as they did. Because we, my sister bought that house. That was your sister, Adelaide. And I had been living at 2308 for 10, and she's at 2507. So when we were both divorced, we decided to live together. So I lived there a long time, and it, it was a fabulous house to live in. And so we got used to that. <laughs> oh, it was great. And uh, just so much space, and just beautiful. I mean, just the house itself. You know, they, I, as they say, the bones mm -hmm. were just so magnificent. Well, we love living there. So when we came up here to command us, we decided we needed a small house. We weren't going to continue all that carrying on over there, entertaining every 10 minutes, you know. So we moved in here, and it fits us like a glove. This right. is this is you and Dottie? Dottie and Dottie, yeah, we moved. Our children by that time were away and in oh. college and that sort of thing. But we do call it the Brennan Hotel because they're in and out. There's always somebody coming here to stay. Well, um, how do we sound, Justin? Are we ready to? We sound great. OK. And we look marvelous. OK. Well, that's well, good. That, that's okay. At this age, I don't really care. <laughs> My sister cares a hell of a lot. <laughs> well, we're here in the uh, the the parlor of uh, Ella Brennan's house on uh, Coliseum Street in New Orleans, uh -huh. in the Garden District, right next door to Commander's Palace, and it's also the home of her sister Dottie Brennan, who is in the room or Somewhere. on the floor, anyway, and may join join us later. Uh, I'm Jack Davis. I'm. Uh, uh, helping uh, with this Loyola Oral History Project inquiry into what happened in the 1970s in New Orleans and, and trying to assess its importance and, and, and its uh, impact. And also with me is uh, uh, Professor Justin Nystrom of the Loyola History Department who is uh, the, um, the main driver of the Oral History Project and Aubrey Bodine, a student at, at Loyola who's assisting with uh, the cameras and the sound and the light, and it's all, it today is uh, June twenty fifth, nineteen two thousand fourteen. <laughs> You're still doing it. Yes, I am. <laughs> I, it's, it's and uh, we are um, our subject, uh, Miss Ella, is to uh, try please to please drop the miss. Okay. The, I won't. I'll feel much better. All right. Younger. Okay. Well, Ella, we have uh, as our focus. Uh, in the, among the many things that you've been involved in, uh, the events, we want to narrow it down to the 1970s and perhaps mm -hmm. some time before and time after, well. but uh, so that we can see where things came from and where they went later on. Okay. Um, but, um, Is that, do we know where that's coming from? It, it's cutting grass, maybe. Yeah. So, see that noise, Danny? Cutting down the tree. Huh? They're putting in something. Oh, over here. Okay. It sounded yeah. like something that may persist. If it's yeah, if it's a short-term phenomenon, we can. <laughs> That's people cutting something. Yeah. They might be cutting out here or across the street. 
Yes. We have a, a building across the street, the Hoffman House on the corner, which we resurrected, and it takes a lot of attention. Yeah. Uh, well, you've managed to keep all of the Ferret buildings together. Well, we're trying very hard for it. Yeah. Yeah. We're trying very hard, and uh, we love the buildings uh, as much as anybody in the neighborhood or the city. I mean, they're part of us, and uh, we certainly respect them. Well, we're we're glad that all those five buildings are there. I guess so. I mean, yeah. one, I mean the, the other two are very small. Those two, three. Let's see, four or five. Well, now we um, we recovered from the the sound, and we just continue where we left off. Um, in in the 1970s, uh, uh, operating from the world of restaurants. Uh, you made many of the changes um, that we're interested in, in, in New Orleans culture and, uh, and way of life, and you reflected others of those changes, and you, uh, you watched the whole thing uh, and it unfold. And to me personally. Not, well, it doesn't have to. <laughs> you could still talk about it, even if it didn't happen directly. Well, it did happen to me. Yes. Okay, so. Well, you, we, we want to see how you saw the 1970s, both as an actor uh, and a doer, and uh -huh. as an observer. Well, we went, we moved up here to Commanders in 1974, which was a very big move in my personal life. We had been at Brennan's for 30 years, and the family was getting so big that we, and they all wanted to be in the restaurant business. They love it, they, and they are in the restaurant business, and so. We came up here, and uh, the restaurant had been operated by some friends of ours, the Moran fam, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Frank and Ellen and Moran, and they lived in this house. And we had gotten to know them over the years. And we had said to them, if you ever retire, think of us. We have all the children. You all don't have children. So that's the way it uh, seemed to us, and we, as I said, we'd frequently, on the way home, I'd stop here and meet my sister and Ralph, and they'd be having a uh, late supper or something, and I'd join them, and Frank Maria was very kind to me. I was very, uh, when I first started coming up here, I was very new in the restaurant business, and totally green. And it was a very exciting experience for me, and it never stopped. It's like, would you believe yesterday? Now, I'm not in the restaurant anymore, but yesterday, they certified eight of our wait staff as certified sommeliers. I mean, it never changes. It keeps going on and keeps being exciting. But going back to the 70s. Yeah, now, you said, how could you say you were green when you'd been in the restaurant business since well, the went, 1940s well, went, when you were well, a teenager? Well, I, that's when I was talking about when I first met the people at Owen Commander. Okay. Yeah. And uh, they, as I said, he was very kind to me. I was still trying to figure out what was beef and what was veal and what was pork. I mean, I really uh, was a very totally a beginner. And as I said, Frank was very kind to me. And uh, I'll never forget one day he took me to, they used to have meat packing houses, Armour and Swift and those kind of companies like down on Porter Street. And I remember he took me one day, he was going for some reason, and he took me. And I'll never forget that. He was very kind. So anyway, uh, we came up here to Commanders, and they they had he had died and she retired, and they sold us Commanders, and this house came with it. And uh, and your family bought Commanders in a, 60, a few years, sixty nine, sixty nine. And and you we didn't come up here to operate. We had people from Brennan's mm -hmm. came up here and were operating. We knew we were going to eventually have some family up here. Uh, so as it turned out, it was us, and we had a, And when you say uh, us, you're referring to... Well, my five brothers and sisters. Okay. We, in our arrangement with Brennan's on Royal Street, we took the five... The, we had three out-of-town restaurants, I think. Houston, Dallas, and Atlanta, and the Friendship House mm -hmm. on the Gulf Coast. And we, so we took Commanders, and they took Brennan's. And uh, we said, well, what are we going to do? Or, you know, we're going we're gonna to stay here. Uh, what, what's going to happen? So everybody lived in the neighborhood. So it was a walk from our houses. So 
we decided, no, you had to move up here. Dottie, my sister, uh, was living in Mary. And it, as she always said, she lived, we thought she lived very far away. But she said, it's one cigarette away. <laughs> so we said, what are we going to do? So we all looked at each other, and we'd been pondering this for a while. And we said, okay, let's try and run the best restaurant we know how. Let's start. And we did, and we never stopped. I just told you about the young sommeliers yesterday. That, yeah, to yeah. me, is extraordinary. And it was in, it, so it was four or five years before, after acquiring commanders, that mm -hmm. you actually took control. Yes, that's true. And did you, did you just start trying and No, we have been day, trying, but you, we, we really Did you have felt, a plan that was... Well, a, we, we wanted it to be the best restaurant in New Orleans. And to us, that meant competing with the top restaurants in the city of New Orleans, which were Antoine's, Galatoire's, Arno's. Okay, that was always a three in my head, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so we went to work, and we decided, well, okay, what we're gonna do. So uh, my two sisters took over the front of the house, and uh, my brother Dick uh, was very, we, had, we didn't have a kitchen. And he was very involved with trying to get the kitchen mm -hmm. organized and straightened out. So I fell into my natural place, which is the food and the service. And Dick and I worked that together. And uh, my brother John one day, he was, John spent a lot of time there with us out in the dining room with the customers when we were doing other things and couldn't be. They was always here. And uh, he, uh, went upstairs, and we, the, with the garden room now, which is our prime room, right. as far as a lot of people are concerned, wasn't, didn't exist. It was like refrigerators and waiters to hang out, changing clothes and things like that. So my brother John straddled the John and looked out one of these small windows. And he said, oh my God, come look at this. Well, the windows were down, I mean, the walls were down, and. It, glass went up instantly. To see the garden. To see the garden. And the garden room became one of our highlights. And when was that? Oh, I don't know. Was it shortly after you Yeah, you we, over? shortly yeah. after we were there. I can't, I, I, the years really, right. in exact timing, I have a problem with that. But it was in, let's say, we went there in 74, so let's say it was 76, 77, something mm -hmm. like that, 78. I don't think it was very early on. And, uh, that's what we were doing in the front of the house. And a short time later, my sisters decided to take the wall out in the main dining room between the two dining rooms. And when they dug down for supports, and I looked down there, and I said, they're out of their minds. They're totally out of their minds. And then I looked up there, and I saw the beams, unbelievably magnificent beams. The structure was breathtaking to me. Why did you think? They were out of their minds at first. Well, number one, the hole was deep. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing was, whoa, that's going to cost money. Because, I, I, of course, I never was in the money end of the business. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I knew, uh, I knew generally the money end, but I mean, I, at that point, I was more, well, I had been in the money end down at Brennan's. So what am I saying? Well, anyway, it impressed me, that hole. And, uh, but when you saw the beams, you realized it would uh, stand? Oh, what? You realized it had enough strength to... Oh, yeah, yeah, but they had to put up something just in the middle there. No, they didn't put anything in the middle. I guess they put them on the sides, and we wound up with this magnificent, lovely dining room. So uh, when I first went there to work, I have to say to you that I said, we don't have any tables. I would left Brennan's, and we had a big restaurant. And when I first went in the restaurant business, my, the people I was looking at, Arnold's and Antoine, were big restaurants. I didn't know anything about little restaurants. I knew we didn't do a big one, we were in trouble. So that's how we started going after the tables, trying to figure, configure the restaurant that it would work as a restaurant. And it was very exciting because all I had to do was look. My sisters, my brother Dick, were very, he was very involved helping them with the construction. And we were just lucky to find great contractors, and so that thing went along amazingly fast and wonderful. And configuring the tables, you mean configuring getting... the walls because yeah. we had very small areas. It was, I mean, it was all these small areas, and we weren't comfortable with that. 
and we didn't think the customer would be comfortable with that. So we tried to make it, and what we actually did was made it in our restaurant. We did all the things that we were comfortable with. And Dick was moved fooling around with the kitchen, fooling around with the kitchen, and uh, doing amazingly well, amazingly well. And uh, it wasn't, I don't think, until the 80s when we really moved the kitchen, early 80s, mm -hmm. very early 80s. That we, no, maybe it was earlier than that, huh? I can't remember. How much did you change the seating capacity of, well, com of commanders before you bought it? We wound up with the, there were two rooms on the first floor. We made that in one. Mm -hmm. And we went upstairs and we made the garden room in one. Now between the two, when you first get the head of the stuff, there's the parlor, which is a lovely room. The window that overlooks this house, by the way. And then we had uh, the Coliseum room, which ran along Coliseum Street, and the little room. The Coliseum and the little, Coliseum and the little room could make private parties. People, mm -hmm. 10, 12, 15, 20, different sizes of rooms. We needed that, but the parlor, had to, we had to take walls out there and make, make it. It wasn't a restaurant, it was lots of little rooms. So we finally got it to be our restaurant. Because when I said when we didn't have any tables, I remember going into the check room and crying and saying, this is a terrible place. You mean because you didn't have enough tables? No, it wasn't or only they... that. We, I wasn't comfortable with the restaurant. I mean, it was boxed up. Uh, it, uh, it did, we, when we were at Brennan's, we had a very spacious, open, mm -hmm. wonderful daylight sunshine shining in. I always like daytime in a restaurant, you know, when you, uh, you have the glass walls and the windows that the light comes in, and in the daytime, it's very nice. At nighttime, you put out candles, which gives it a totally different atmosphere. So we had to get comfortable, and we did. How many years did it take to get comfortable? Oh, Just, it didn't take long. Okay. Mm -mm. When, when you came uptown in 1974, the New Orleans was, would you say New Orleans was in the middle of a, of a major change in the world of restaurants? Yes. I, I mean, all, the, all of these traditional restaurants. The had, owners were getting older. Getting older, and, and new people were, were coming in. New people were coming in, in. In new restaurants. And new restaurants. Uh, I particularly remember uh, Jonathan's. Mm -hmm. with the, on down on Rampart Street was that uh, Tom Coleman was the chef. Right. And I remember that restaurant being particularly un New Orleans in the fact that it was in a beautiful old building, but it was decorated beautifully. I mean, it was attractive, handsome, good looking building. It wasn't historically yeah. pure, but the house was pure. You know what I mean? It was, it was good. Was that something of a breakthrough for New Orleans? I think that for New Orleans, I think it was, and I think Tom was a hell of a Because chef. of the, the menu and because of well, the decor? Well, I think the decor, and I think the approach to the menu. Uh, in New Orleans, uh, we're a big seafood restaurant town, mm -hmm. and uh, they had to, uh, Tom came up with some different versions of uh, fish, crab meat, shrimp, we didn't have, we, crawfish wasn't around a lot then. Crawfish came into the restaurants later. Um, and he, he did lovely things, and they looked lovely. And right about that time, I'm sitting in Commanders one day, and the phone rang, and it's Howard Jacobs from the Tom Speaking. Mm -hmm. The and columnist. He said, huh? The columnist. Yes, lovely man. And he called me up and he said, Ella, tell me about Nouvelle Cuisine. Now, I'm a girl that's traveled a lot. I go to New York to keep in touch. I've been to Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, mainly for educational purpose, to really understand what I was trying to learn how to do. And uh, he told me that, uh, where was I? Um, you said that Howard Jacobs Howard asked Jacobs about called, Nouvelle Cuisine. asked about Nouvelle Cuisine. And, uh, I said, Howard, I don't know what you're talking about. And I mean, I was getting, I get every restaurant, right? of course there weren't that many. There was Gourmet and mm -hmm. what else? I mean, there weren't that many restaurant magazines, but there were the traditional classics that, you know, Italian country, holiday, and that sort of thing. I had mentioned New Nouvelle Cuisine. So we had to immediately go into researching what is Nouvelle Cuisine. And when we found out, we said, ooh, we don't think that's going to work in the audience. Why? Just define it 
Well, and, and say why it wouldn't work. Well, they were, number one, it was cutesy poo. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think so. And uh, I don't think New Orleans were into that. I mean, getting this on their plate was something with a, a very tiny, uh, it wasn't dinner to New Orleans. So we were experimenting with that. And I'm, I don't know the exact year I'm talking about, I don't know. But we, we, got Paul, we had Paul Prudhomme in the kitchen by that time. So that was after 76? Yes. I, I don't remember exactly when Paul came in. I read that he came in 76. All right, that's I would it. defer to you, of well, course. No, I mean, I'm telling you, the years sometimes merge. Uh, Paul was there, and we were very much into uh, combining, I don't think rightly, but we were combining a lot of Creole dishes with New Orleans dishes. Mm -hmm. And I came to learn that experimenting with all of them would produce a fantastic menu, which I happen to love, and I'm always trying to do it better, but I think it's pretty good right now. And uh, Paul was there, and we, uh, as you know, he had a big problem standing up. Mm -hmm. But we sat frequently in the kitchen at what is the chef's table. We had eventually gotten that there. And, and you we, were, that was you and Paul, and who else would be around that chef's table? Well, my brother Dick, mm -hmm. Dottie would re come in and sit there, uh, uh, maybe somebody from the front of the house in, in, in mm -hmm. working in the restaurant. It was a combined, anybody was welcome. I mean, it wasn't a secret meeting of any kind. On Wednesdays, Wednesday afternoons, we had upstairs in that little old building I'm telling you about, uh, we would see, we would call it our food meeting. We'd have food, food meeting on Wednesday. No excuses, Wednesday afternoon, three o'clock, we all, and then we came downstairs when Paul couldn't go up those steps anymore. And we would sit there, and that's where he did the, um, one day, I'll never forget Betty Hoffman, as a lady who worked with us, and uh, Betty said, uh, we got to get something, we need something, we need something, we need something new on the menu, something great on the menu. And I said, well, the best dish I had ever eaten in my life, no, I said I had dreamed of eating, was if somebody caught the fish, cooked it on the fire right there at the, uh, the water, at water's edge. And just that fish, my mother used to cook, my mother was a fantastic cook. And I don't know where she learned, but she had magic in her hands. And we, I wanted that fish, because she frequently would cook the fish, and you get this marvelous white meat of the fish with fabulous taste. She knew how to season, you know? And I said, I want that in the restaurant. I want to get that in the restaurant. And uh, we worked on it for a long time. And uh, Paul called it, uh, we called it uh, grilled gulf fish, which wasn't what my mother cooked. What do we call it? Grilled redfish. Mm -hmm. And Paul changed it into uh, blackened redfish. Well, you know what happened to that. Mm -hmm. And that they, they went off fish. And that was in response to your specifications for a new dish. Yes. And Paul came up with the, the, a version that we could do in the restaurant that moment. And uh, it, as I say, it spread everywhere because it, it was basically a simple piece of fish with extraordinarily good seasonings. And I'll never remember, my, always remember my brother Dick coming in the kitchen and saying to every young cook, you must season both sides of the fish or the chicken or whatever he was talking about. You just don't sprinkle seasoning on the top. You turn the fish over and you season the whole fish. We wanted to have New Orleans taste. In fact, they did a video called Taste that Jimmy Smith was one of our fabulous young who came old eventually, but he came very young. And Jimmy just cooked, I call it magic in your hands. You either can cook or you can't cook. And Jimmy did this wonderful cooking. And so Dick would made this video to make sure that anybody came to work, they had to sit down and understand from Jimmy's demonstration, from our mouths, how we felt about the taste of the food. This was the, the, the commander's way of working in the kitchen. Yes, I guess you could call did, that. Did we the, had grown was, up. Was the blackened redfish something you put on the menu yeah, right away? Yeah, we didn't call it blackened. 
We called it grilled, grilled red golf. fish. Cool. And we put in a grill. And we had, uh, it became very popular and still is. Uh, but Paul How took it another step and blackened it with more seasoning. Did he do that at Commander's or did he wait? He did it at Commander's, but we didn't call it that. Yeah. When he left, he started calling it that. He, when he went and started his own Yeah. Restaurant. Now, I don't mean to say Paul didn't have anything to do with that dish. He had, it was, his, he cooked it. We talked. But it was what we call um, Wednesday afternoon foodie. We call Benny Hoffman, I am convinced, came up with the word foodies it, first in the United States. She got to call it our foodies meeting. Because we would go sit up there and we'd just talk, whatever you had on your mind. I mean, you'd say, I had, well, last night I went to so and so's for dinner. And it had this extraordinary whatever, whatever, whatever. Because that time there was a big, big change going on. Sorry about that. That's okay. We, we like to hear it. <laughs> uh, that's the, that's uh, Tallulah. We didn't introduce Tallulah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't introduce. She was jump all over. So all of this excitement and food was going on with us and trying to get Paul to reduce the uh, heaviness of a lot of the Creole dishes by making gumbo without a root. Did you ever hear of that? Mm -hmm. no, it's, well, it's that. before then. You can have it. it. It's absolutely, it's a magnificent broth of seafood. I mean, you could say it was our version of uh, uh, blue bays, but it wasn't. I mean, we did not use, uh, what's that marvelous seasoning? Uh, oh, I'll come up with it. It's the marvelous seasoning you use with the blue bays. It won't come to my mind. I saffron, mm -hmm. and it it uh, it gave a certain taste to uh, bula bays, but gumbo was just making a seafood broth, a brown seafood broth, and using uh, um, all the fresh seafood that we had, uh, you know everything in it, like uh, pieces of redfish, shrimp. Uh, we weren't in the crawfish at that time. Uh, uh, crab meat, shrimp, piece of whatever fish they were doing. Uh, that, I guess that was it. And uh, it was a nice variety. And uh, so it became an excellent dish. We were very crazy about it. And we, at that time, Paul had, had, had made the bread, the bread pudding souffle. And he... Uh, We said, Paul, you gotta make it lighter. You gotta make something light out of it. We, we had this make ever some bread pudding. I think mm -hmm. the best bread pudding Lord ever put on work or improvement even on my mother. And it was made by a guy named Floyd Beeler, who was sort of held held uh, took care of our lunch. And Paul made that. It was it was like a bread pudding with custard. So I can tell you, it, it was fantastic. And we said, we've got to light it. We just can't keep that. We'll serve it at lunch, but at dinner, we, with the dinner, we've got to. Have. So he made the bread pudding souffle, which became pfft, instantly a success. So now you're inventing these new Don't combinations. We're not inventing anything. But you're, you're changing the combinations and you're using the food the, mm -hmm. that New Orleans loves mm -hmm. and trying to make it less heavy. And Creole food mm -hmm. was never that heavy. Creole food. And I don't really know what Creole food is, except I think we cook it every day. But it wasn't as heavy as Paul was coming on with the, what we call pot cooking in Creole country. He was coming on with these heavy dishes. People adored them, but eventually you got to the point where you couldn't eat them. You see what happens if you eat them, and I ate them all the time. But if you're not inventing, you're changing. You're sort yes. of, you're reinvigorating. Right. And That's so did you, did, did this get attention Ooh. for commanders? Let me tell you, that's when it all really happened. And I don't think, not, I don't like to say this, but every major magazine in America wrote a story about it. And uh, it was unbelievably good for the business and the rest of everybody was coming there and entertaining there. And everybody. And Did it, it have an impact? Beyond uh, commanders and the Brennan 
restaurants oh. and oh, I don't into, know New, into New Orleans. Well, I, mean, I have to did say. Did you find that people, other restaurants in New Orleans? Well, were, I remember particularly, there was one man who was a psychiatrist, and he opened Marty's restaurant. Mm -hmm. and he eventually it became, uh, he moved from there and he opened another one on Decatur Street. Uh, right, Spisa. Uh, Spisa's. And Larry, what's it, uh, Larry, what's his name now? He's a, he was a psychiatrist and a doctor, and he opened both these mm -hmm. restaurants. And he began getting involved like I had. He didn't cook, him, or maybe he did, but I mean, he mm -hmm. wasn't the chef. But he was changing that menu at Spices tremendously. And so what we were all trying to do is we knew that everybody in New Orleans liked the New Orleans food. They loved it. But every restaurant had the same menu. What was in the What air? was it that said? Yeah. That they may be, I can't get the quote, but it was something like they were five dishes and they had five minute recipes or something for it. I think, I think our friend Jean Berg told me it was, Excuse they me. have 500 restaurants and five recipes? That's what I'm trying to say. I couldn't and, think of it, but that's true. But so you started, you and these others started adding more recipes. Yes, yes. And what was it that allowed that to happen? What, what, what was it about the 1970s, if I can try to get well, to that? Well, what happened is that we were determined to run the best restaurant we knew how. So we were devoting a tremendous amount of time to it. And the foodie meetings were resulting in a lot of things. Uh, in the city, I think, I think the city was becoming a... Wasn't Moon Landrew mayor about that time? Yes, he started in 1970. And Moon had given... A, yes, he had given a really good uh, spin on the city as far as people who lived here. S mentally, we were proud of uh, what Moon was trying to do politically. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess we were hoping and help, trying to think that the schools were going to get better. And there were reasons why the schools were going to get better. The whole community was in an up mood. And then there came a little recession in the middle of the 70s, but we didn't notice it. Mm -hmm. I did not know there was a recession at that time. I didn't have time to read like I do constantly. Uh, and New Orleans just seemed to be on a sparkling, let's do it, we can do it, let's go. And we had learned from my brother Owen when I was very young that you should be friends with all the people in the restaurant business. They in the same business as you are, and nobody should be competitors. Mm -hmm. We should be friends. So we started that. We did our best to go eat in their restaurants, and they started eating in our restaurants, and we all became this big happy family. I'm not saying they weren't anybody close before, but we worked at keeping it going, that everybody would be friendly. So we all got to be very friendly, and we were... You think you... you, you know, the restaurant business was changing from being... I'm ashamed of my child who's a cook. A little bit more than I'm proud of him to the point where it's okay if he wants to be a chef. That mm -hmm. sort of was going on at that time. And we, we were very happy to be part of that. And one of the things I have to say to you, in addition to foodie meetings, we told our staff, we want you to be part of making this happen. And we want you to learn and grow. I bought more cookbooks than anybody in America. They all had a study, the first study, 137 pages of Escoffier, mm -hmm. which was basic French cooking. Gave them every new cookbook that came out. And really, we were teaching, teaching, teaching. They used to laugh about, oh, Miss Ella's got somebody at the table. Well, I would catch somebody that was seen to be free at the moment, and I'd sit down and I'd say, what's going in your head? Tell me what you're thinking about. I'll tell you what I'm thinking This is about. one of your employees. Yes. And I felt it was a wonderful way to operate with having all the people involved. Now, I, that didn't come to me just out of the blue. I had a pretty sensational brother named Owen. I had a sister named Adelaide. I'm sorry about that. Mm. And they sort of taught me this. And so it was a spirit that they built up in the family. We're a very close family. 
we have had our moments, but we're very close. And so we wanted to include these people we're working next to, right next to all day long, into learning. Read this book, study this book, tell me what you think about this book. And that was all going on. And it was very exciting. And about that time, Emil appears on the scene because Paul's wife had opened the restaurant in the French Quarter. And he. K. Paul's. K. Paul's. And he wanted yes, to. That was about home. 1979, I think. Well, oh, all right. That's about the time Paul left. And he didn't leave like that. I mean, he said, Look, I got to go help K. Mm -hmm. You all figure something out. I'll be here till you do, which is what we did. But at that time, we were opening Mr. B's. That was an interesting part of Also 1979. Yeah. Mr. B's. We wanted to be back in the French Quarter a little bit. We had grown up in the restaurant business there. And, uh, we had a lot on our minds about uh, being less of a fine dining restaurant, but an absolutely fine restaurant. Fine, mm -hmm. maybe not the mm -hmm. word, but great food, extraordinarily great food in a more relaxed atmosphere. Of course, the people came with coats and tires anyway. But that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to make it a little bit less expensive, although our goal at Commanders was never to be an expensive restaurant. We never wanted to be the top restaurant in prices in New Orleans. Uh-uh, you gotta stay down there, which we still do today. Uh, so we worked on Mr. B's, and we put in a, a wood grill, mm -hmm. and started all kinds of- Was uh, that wood grill inspired by the, the grilled gulf fish facility at Part of that, yes. Yes, and uh, the gumbo yaya that they have at Mr. Bean, all of that was coming from all of us. Mm -hmm. And Paul went down and helped us open it. I mean, he was helping write the menu. He was very involved. And uh, we were very lucky in the people that we were able to bring in down there. We sent Jimmy Smith down there, who was the taste guy in our outfit. But anybody that was working there had to understand yeah. what Jimmy was doing. And so we had this opportunity to get this restaurant. It was a pornography store and a tiki yati type Chinese restaurant. And I'll never forget Dick, we all said ceiling so low, ceiling so low. And Dick went down, because there was a parking lot above it. It had been the old Solaris. Mm -hmm. Remember that wonderful one? You know about that yeah. old store? I the never saw The grocery store had been there, which we knew quite well, because my mother shopped there a lot. Upstairs, so Dick got in the restaurant and stood on a chair or something push the acoustical ceiling up, he was 6'3", you know, and push his hand up, and he said, we can do this here, we can do this here. And he came you back You can raise the ceiling. And he said, we got this, we gotta get, we gotta get this, and oh yeah, we had to take out, we gutted the building. Again, we dug it up. But the parking lot was upstairs, and they had a great foundation. So I don't think we, we well, we had to gut the building, right. and what they did for engineering was, I do not know, but, it was an exciting, exciting experience uh, being back in the quarter. Uh, and let's see. But so did you, by coming back, by taking this form, you basically had tested out this formula over several years at Commanders. Yes. And you took, you took the best of that, am I, do I have this right? You took the best of that to Mr. Yes. B's. But we took at Mr. B's and put on more dishes that I now want to get back on at dinner at Commander. Mm -hmm. But we didn't use to serve it in uh, Brent, at Commander's. We had a great lunch menu at Brennan's. Right. And we did things like great stew, beef bourguignon. They had to read the first time the 37 pages. They knew what beef bourguignon was. So we had to run a great beef stew. We had to run short ribs. We had to run a uh, uh, rabbit. Uh, all these native New Orleans things and, and worldly things that we were not serving at Commanders at dinner. So we got, the, we said, we got the great lunches menu in the world, let's put it down there for dinner. So that's kind of how that evolved. And we got, well, we, I just think it's, it's a great menu down there. Was it, so if, do I have this straight, that when you got to, you, you took control of Commanders in 1974, you, you, you more or less, um, intuited your way into the formula that you ended up with at Commander several years later, and then you took a lot of the lessons that you learned and had a, 
We you took had, the lunch menu. Yeah. But you took to Mr. B's a, yeah. for, a, a plan. Yes. But you we didn't. You didn't. Doing. You didn't take over commanders with a no. as, as good well, a plan, we, with, well, with we, as solid a plan as we that. were going to be as good as we were at Brennan's. Mm -hmm. What better? I mean, we to this day we try to be better. I mean, I promise you. Mm -hmm. uh, we all read every magazine published. We travel. Uh, we keep up with. Uh, what are the interesting foods that people are talking about? Uh, or we hope we can make them talk about. And uh, so we're working all day. The menu, uh, we don't have a static menu at Commanders. It changes. And right now, I'm thrilled with the way it's turned out. We have a table d'hote dinner. Uh, she can get a three course dinner below $40. Then you have the a la carte, the appetizers, the entrees. And then we have up in the corner over here what they call, what they call in the chef's playground. And that changes constantly. Certainly the dinner menu changes constantly. They, whatever's in their mind they're going to put on today, whatever at the grocery, I mean the grocery, whatever they're right. buying today, uh, they're going to get on that menu. They change it at least once a week. Sometimes they change it in the middle of the week. They can't get the fish they want, they can't get whatever. They, they now print them up in the office. I, I mean, I used to remember the mimeograph machine, you know, and um, the, the dirty fingers from mm -hmm. the ink and all that kind of stuff. They have this magnificent machine that even prints in color. And they print the menu, and they can print the menu, and they can go up there and <laughs> half hour, they got it print. When the Mr. B's menu hit the French Quarter, what impact did it have Quite on the rest of the impact. restaurant business? Quite Tell me. an impact. What, on how the did city. you see it? Uh, no more than they thought, they, it's hard to put into words what they thought of uh, anything, you know what I mean? But you knew all of a sudden the people were packing in and all the other restaurants were packing in. I mean, we were going to their restaurant, I mean, we'd work all day and whoever had the BOD duty, you know what that is? That's no. the Brennan on duty. So we had to have one or two people there at night to greet and talk and see. And we others were free. And I promise you, every other night we go out to dinner. We were some of the best restaurant customers in the city. We love to go out to dinner. And, where, and what, what places uh, in... We began the, having places to go. What places right after Mr. B's launch? Oh, did, that's pretty hard did to you, say. Right you think after Mr. Was, B's. Or, well, we said, we said species. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan didn't last long. No. It was very sad. It didn't last long. And there was... Um, Right after, I went right down the streets and try and look. Um, Uptown always had Manali's. Um, at one point there was a Pataris mm -hmm. was a restaurant, and he was getting into he was getting into a lot of. Uh, I think it was game. And seafood, and, and lobsters, sea and yeah, those sort that sort of thing. He was getting, he was really working on that menu and building it. So that was going on up there. And I'm just trying to think about the other restaurants that, uh, there weren't always that many. You well, know, did, did Mr. B's uh, spark a lot of... Uh, I think so. Of, 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 of new kinds of thinking about well, the restaurants. Well, a lot of them weren't necessarily new kinds of thinking, but a lot of people went into business. Mm -hmm. Then after they got into business, they actually did their thing. Uh, uh, as I said, Larry used to sit at table eight uh, and learn the restaurant business there. He was a psychiatrist on his side. So uh, I'm trying to think of the other restaurants that open. I'm going up and down Royal Street. I'm going up and down. Bourbon Street always had its great old seafood houses. Mm -hmm. They didn't change. They had oyster bars and fried seafood restaurants. And I'm trying to go down Bourbon Street. Well, there was Street. a lot of... Um if you looked at the journalism about food in New Orleans, if we went from having no restaurant writers or restaurant critics uh, in 1970 to having a whole fleet of them uh, in, by 1980. You had Richard Collin. Uh, oh, do I remember him. Do you know what he did? Well, do you want me to say? Yes, I do. Because <laughs> he, 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 he worked at the State's Item uh, also. Yes. I mean, he, we he had just come, he had been time. very kind to Brennan's, and we just came up to command. We were just there at command. She was in the hospital, 
at the Baptist Hospital it was a Saturday before Mardi Gras. She had just had a mastectomy, a serious mastectomy, major. And I'm at commands, we just pulling ourselves together and trying to think we're gonna do a disruption. A friend hands me the time, the, I don't know. It was state side? State side. And it was a review of our restaurant and it was a black ball. Now for years I called it a, uh, I didn't think of it as a black ball. It wasn't that quick to get that message, but it was a terrible, terrible review. And there I am sitting with her in the hospital. That was in his second restaurant book, right? About 1976? Our second restaurant? No, it was, I think he published that New Orleans Restaurant no, Guide. This was in the newspaper. Yeah. I don't remember. So remember. it was before you really got your hands on commanders. Yeah, yeah we, we were just beginning yeah. to grow there. I mean, we were there, but we weren't functioning. In fact, I remember when the day we went to work at Commanders, we said, okay, Monday is the day we're gonna go to work at Commanders, and it was a week after Mardi Gras. We said, enjoy Mardi Gras, Monday we go to work. And we had just gotten up there, and as I said, that happened to her, and uh, it just floored me. It just floored me. So he didn't like it? Oh, of course he didn't. I didn't like it either. But he liked it. He Plus, liked he liked Commanders in his underground gourmet book that had preceded his Times Picking Oh, I mean, maybe sorry, that's true. Preceded I, his states. I, I, I think maybe that's right. And I don't remember. I'm, I'm, I'm positive you may be right, but you got to check it. So he, he downgraded the restaurant. Ooh. Certainly. And did that help you or urge you? It, well, I mean, it did, certainly got our attention, mm. to put it mildly. And. Uh, that was what doing that part of when we were, were we going to try and run this best restaurant. And we were working every day. And uh, it really did get our attention. And uh, we read all his publicity, too. Uh, I remember, uh, well, we're not going to go into that. Uh, oh, no, so, go ahead. No, no, no. Okay. Well, he, um, but he continued to write in the state's item. Mm hmm. Uh, did he come around to a different review of? Uh, uh, of I really don't commanders. remember that. Yeah. I couldn't tell you that. Did, did he have an influence on the way restaurants behaved in New Orleans? Did, did he... Sp well, he did, everybody disliked him intensely. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. When Gene Borg got on the paper, everybody loves Gene. Yeah. Gene became the restaurant critic in the mid-80s. Well, I promise you, yeah. everybody loved him. Uh, uh, but Richard Collin was the first. He and his wife. Yeah, and she joined. And they were that. really, um, I think we thought. No, I don't think it commanders. Now I didn't think commanders was a good record. I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. I was working awfully hard to try and change that. But it it was so low and underhanded. I thought it at that moment. He knew we had left Brennan's after having invented breakfast at Brennan's and done all the Brennan's mm -hmm. stuff for many years, and we were going up to commanders and I. Word was to everybody, we're going to do the best we know how. We're going to change this restaurant. And it was right at that time when it. <laughs> so, well, uh, everything was affecting us at that time. Mm -hmm. It was a real turmoil in our, all of our lives. But yet we were going in there every day and working at it. And we got our feet on the ground and we started being able to do interesting things. So we got Paul to come up. Yeah, why did you get Paul? What 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 was it that made you look for? Well, we Paul? know we knew we did we needed a chef. Mm -hmm. We had never had a chef. We had cooks who we called chefs. We never had a chef. And I don't think Paul was really what you call a chef. I think Paul was a great, magnificent cook. I was looking for a chef. At one point at Brennan's, I had hired a Swiss Swiss can't say Swiss chef. And he brought with him a Austrian, no, the chef I hired was Swiss, and I was Austrian, and the sous chef was Switzerland. When he came down at Brennan's, he started changing the menu to more European, more in the continental. And I'll never Dick saying to me, if you don't get him out of here, we're going to close. Being in that, he couldn't stand the food, we couldn't stand the food. He was getting but, too far away from Creole? Oh, yeah. But, and, and I was very mistaken. I mean, at that point, I had been spending my life in European cookbooks and going to France, and in my head, I was trying. All right. Uh, so 
that happened. And uh, I'll, I'll, let's see, the, the thing he did for us that was so monumental, he taught us how to run an organized kitchen. He put in the traditional European kitchen, which is very organized and very different from what we were doing. I mean to tell you, we were pitiful. We did not know, and nobody was working for us knew. At that time, you didn't have Did any, anybody in New Orleans know? Maybe the hotels. I don't, I'm sure. Maybe a hotel or two had a European chef that organized a kitchen. I don't know. There was nobody you could go call up and say, would you come organize mm -hmm. my kitchen? You know, uh, so he did that for us. And he left, and the sous chef stayed. Uh, Rudy Donahue, I remember him very well. And he stayed with us. And actually, he went over to operate the Dallas restaurant. He did very well there. Uh, so we had, when we got our kitchen organized, whee, what a relief that was. And Paul came into that kitchen. So you knew you had a job description for a chef. Uh huh. And you went. Did you search? Well, the job description was not what you would call classic. Mm -hmm. I mean, what they did in the continental restaurants. We wanted a chef to be in this organized kitchen, just physically organized, the equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, but we wanted to have, we wanted a New Orleans restaurant. We never have changed that. We grew up with a mother who knew how to cook. Mm -hmm. She seasoned magnificently. And she had brothers that would go hunting, hunting and fishing. And they would come and say, Nellie, we're here. Come see what we have. And we'd all run out the side porch and see what they brought fish, they brought ducks, they brought rabbits, whatever they brought. And my mother cooked all that. For us, we grew up pretty magnificently in the food mm -hmm. department. Of course, I didn't learn how to cook. My mother had a wonderful black lady, Leona Nichols. And between my mother and Leona, they cooked. And we tell the story, Dottie and I tell the story all the time, about when my mother cooked fried oysters on a Friday night. We had this big table in the kitchen, and she would cook the oysters and french fries. She'd cook it for you, and she'd serve you. The stove was right, right there, and this was the table. Then she'd cook your potatoes mm -hmm. and oysters. She cooked the oysters very little, and did not over season them. I mean, did not over batter them. She was a magnificent cook. So we, we knew that. I mean, we knew how food should taste. You know, mm -hmm. and so many little cooks you would hire, you couldn't let them go in the kitchen. You know, they were dangerous. So when you were hiring a chef, after- Terry Flatridge was a lady on television in uh -huh. New Orleans, and she was leaving New Orleans. Right. And she came to have, we were gonna have like a farewell luncheon together. We had become friends over the years. And I said, Terry, I've got to find the right chef for this restaurant. I can't, I can't, we can't keep operating the way we're operating. We've got to have somebody that's in charge in that kitchen. And it was me and Dick. And I promise you, I didn't know any more than he did, and he didn't know any more than I did. So we were doing our best. And she said, oh, my Lord, I have a friend named Paul Bruno. She said, let me go to the phone right now. She got up from the table, went to the telephone, and called Paul and said, as soon as you can, Today, tomorrow, come up and see Ellen. That's how we got Paul. So he was your only candidate? Only candidate. That's, that's interesting. And he... And he'd only been in New Orleans for a year or well, so. Well, he worked for me at Brennan's, he swears, as a busboy. Oh. When he was very small, short, and thin. I did not recognize him. And so we sat in the kitchen. And we started talking. Dick, me, uh, I don't know who else was talking at the time, but uh, anybody in my family had walked by, I promise you, was sitting there. And we started talking to Paul. And he said, well, you know, I have problems. I can't work the kitchen uh, like a chef really does. Because of his mobility? Yes. Yeah. And he could, he, at that time he was walking, but he couldn't stand long periods of time. So we said, don't worry about that. We just need help make these people understand taste. And um, we went to work, and he said, I'll take lunch. I'll come and do lunch for you. We said, fine. Well, no one, Paul, the next thing you know, he, had, he was in charge of everything, which was to our delight. And we worked together 
for a long time. I think it was about five or six years. Then we got to know each other well, and I think he did extremely great things, but we were leaning more and more to the heavy Creole. And when he said to me he was going, I, wondered, I knew I wanted to find somebody that could do it lighter, more like my mother did. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't just heavy, heavy Cajun food. So you started your second search uh -huh. at, because Paul Prudhomme was leaving. Uh huh. And did, did you, how long did it take before you got Emeril Lagasse? Uh, well, we had another man there that was a German, oh, it was a continental chef, mm -hmm. who could hold the fort down and Emeril could go. So he was there entering, what was his name? Uh, he was just there for a short time. And he knew what we were doing. He knew that Paul was leaving and that we were looking for somebody. Can't think of his name right now. He eventually wound up in Mobile. I'll think of it. And uh, so. We can come back to that. By the, no, the Fill reason, that in later. Yeah, the search for uh, a chef after Paul began. And I had, I had looked out, I had reached out, I talked to everybody I knew in the business. Around, the, around talking, the country? Yeah, we were, we were gonna go out in New Orleans if we had to. Dick was uh, on the board of the National Restaurant Association, he was talking to all those guys, I was talking. And I, there was a man that I had met, and uh, I called him, on, I can't remember his name right now. I called him on the telephone and I said, look, I'm looking for a chef. I want somebody who is very talented in cooking and somebody who uh, would be adaptable to becoming a New Orleans type cook. I didn't want a New England, he was, we'll, we'll talk about that. I didn't want somebody from New England or California mm -hmm. cooking their food. Mm -hmm. I wanted New Orleans food. I was adamant about that. I, mean, I keep saying I, we were a team, okay? My brother and I and my si other s sisters, and we, we worked on this together. So they kept pushing me to handle the food and the kitchen. and then I, So along comes, uh, he sends me a resume. And I say to him, I can't hire that man. I don't, I don't even want to bring him down because I'm rejecting him before he comes. And he said, that's not fair. And he said to me, he's pretty sensational as far as a young man is concerned, he's very mature. He taught me to come, I mean, coming down. I'll never forget Emil showed up here on a, he, he, Sunday and Monday he was gonna be here. So we, we were sitting down, uh, my brother and I talking, we sat down in the dining room and had a meal, and we were talking to him. And uh, he was this very attractive uh, young man and very intelligent. I mean, we fell in love with him right away. And we talked to him a lot about the changes he'd have to make, that we did not want the food that was coming out of, uh, basically, uh, New England. No, let's say New York. We love New York. We love to go there, we go there constantly, but we wanted New Orleans food. And the whole difference is seasoning. I mean, you can take the same piece of fish and cook it in New Orleans and cook it in New York, it's very different. And Emeril wanted the job. He wanted the job. Did he have to convince you that he could do it? Yes, we had to send him in the kitchen. Uh, Sunday, the next day, he went, oh, Monday was the next day. And we said, just go do something for us. So he did something, and we kind of watched what he was doing. I said, okay, he knows what he's doing in the kitchen. He had graduated from Johnson and Wales uh, Culinary Institute and had been working around in some hotels in New York. He hadn't had a, he didn't have a good background. And so, and it did not, he did, hadn't worked anywhere that I was impressed with, and I, he was too young, inexperienced as far as I was concerned. But after we spoke to him, you looking one? No, I just. Uh, oh, I, we spoke to him. My brother Dick and I together, and Dick went off and called me to the telephone, and said, "That's him, huh?" I said, "Yeah, let's go with him." So. Monday night we told him, look, we'd like you to come down. So we had to wait several months because he was married, had a baby, and his wife was pregnant. We had to find a house here. We had to sell a house there. You know, the usual routine of mm -hmm. a move. So <laughs> this is all in my mind like it's happening on your camera. Uh, so we, Dick and I started worrying. 
and we decided, okay, you worry one day, I'll worry the next. Let's work the other day. We were that worried. We were joking with mm -hmm. you. You're, say, you're taking a big chance. You were taking a big, big chance. You're making a, a big investment in all of the uh -huh. uh, expense and, and uh, responsibility. So, uh, and we got here, and he went to work. And every afternoon between three and five, we talked to him. We tasted everything he cooked. We were on his back like you wouldn't believe, and we were, I will say to Dan, sorry about that, but I wasn't going to have him come in and, and feel that he could cook the way he, whatever he wanted. Well, how much, in the beginning, how much did you have to reject? Well, I remember seasoning, the taste of New Orleans mm -hmm. food, the taste. You know, there's meat, fish, chicken, and eggs. But the New Orleans meat, fish, chicken, and eggs, which I think are very different. They're native to this community, the way we cook. So he was so young and so affable, and I can't say enough wonderful things about him. And he started. And he, we had him eat in every restaurant. Yeah, where did you take him fr first? What, what was the thing that made the biggest impact I don't know. on him? Do you remember, Daddy, where we took him first? Or f early on? Um, well, I'm sure I took him to Antoine's and Orno's and Galatoire's. And then I, I'm sure I took him up to Benali's for those barbecued shrimp. And, you know, that wonderful Italian food, which was kicked in the, cooked in their mother's kitchen at that time and brought to the restaurant. I ate there enough to know that. And they would tell me. Mm -hmm. I, I would say what Mama's cooking tonight. And they would say, this is what we have and that's what we would eat. And I'm trying to think, you know, we sent him, of course, to Jonathan's and species and there weren't too many restaurants in the corner and, and around in those days. Mm -hmm. There really weren't. You should take it to was, La Provence or La Provence or Larousse Eventually, or? but I don't even know if La Provence was there. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that restaurant in Metairie, that French, is it French or, French or Italian? French man, um, right. I don't even French, I should know his name, in Metairie. Whose name slips my mind. Yeah, you know. We, we can slip that in later. Which the restaurant up in Mary, the French chef, Chris. Chris. Yeah, oh, he's going by his first name. I, I can't. We'll come up with it. He. We sent him there. At that time, we liked Provence when it came out, and in the years I don't know how to place it, but if it was the open, we sent him there because mm -hmm. we liked to go there. We'd, Sunday afternoon, Jesus, let's get out of here and go drive over to Chris's at La Provence. And um, they weren't, uh, I'm sure we sent him that wonderful seafood, catfish, fried seafood, and Hammond right up there on mm -hmm. the highway. I, we sent him everywhere. And we said, now that you go to the, the steakhouses, the seafood steakhouses in the corner, fried seafood. They batter too much, they overcook. New Orleans loves that, but we're not doing that here. You can't batter that heavy. You can't overcook. You've got to understand what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So we worked on all of that. Did you send him into Cajun country? Not at that time. Mm -hmm. Not at that time. Because I'm trying to, uh, uh, uh. Mm -hmm. And well, we did send him to New York. That point in New York, they were opening. Jim Baum was restaurant associates. And they were opening a lot of new restaurants. Now, the restaurants I had been going to in New York were like Chambord which is a classic, magnificent French restaurant. It was like a bistro, I guess. We walked in the whole right-hand side, it was glass, and it was all French cooking in there. And, oh, I love to go to Chambord. And there was, uh, well, there was another great one. Uh, well, that, we went to all the restaurants in New York that were, but most of them, most of them, not Chambord, had opened from when the World's Fair was in New York. It started a bunch of chefs the, like La Pavillon, mm -hmm. I can't remember the rather, oh, oh uh, Cote Basque, those kind of restaurants were chefs that came out of restaurants, so, I mean, uh, the World's Fair. They brought a series of great cooks to America. And so uh, we would go up there and go to those restaurants. And, and they were with Emerald still. 
Yeah, Emerald would go too. We, we, before we got Emerald, we had been doing this, but as soon as Emerald got with us, we said, okay, plan a trip to New York for this time. We want you to go home, 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 home. So he would plan the trip and he would go. And we said, meet the people, meet the people, get to know the people. We'd write notes or call up ahead of time uh, so he could go. Jim, Joe Baum had opened at that time the Four Seasons, mm -hmm. which is still today, I think, one of the best restaurants mm -hmm. in the United States. But he had opened some crazy restaurants now. Tala Suite. And what was that other big one? Caesars. Huh? Uh, Four Seasons. No, well, I know Four Seasons. And the one, one that was one at, uh, oh, anyway, Se Forum of the Twelve Caesars. That's what I was right, thinking. Right. And then he opened Tala Suite. And I'm trying to remember them. There were at least five in New York at that time. And Jim Baum knew what he was doing. He was a great. So you shaped Emerald to this, your, to your edge, what you'd already been educated to, to about. And I wanted the him. Great to, restaurants of the world and New Orleans. Yes, I wanted him to know them inside out, so he'd know where I was trying to go. Right. I didn't want him to think. Anything less was okay with me. How long did it take you to get him to where you thought he could work on his own? Well, he was absolutely smart as a whip and learned as fast as we could teach him something, he got it. You know, he was like that, mm -hmm. she, let's do this, let's do that, do this, do that. And then, of course, he started feeding back, let's do this, let's do that. He was fast. He grew, I mean, like a weed, I mean, just grew. He, I have nothing but extremely strong compliments to pay Emma. Still do, I think he's a great guy. And what he's done has been magnificent. And I told him, when he first came to work for us. I want you known in the food world. I want you to know those people and I want them to know you. And I'd say, go in the office in the morning and call three or four people to know on the phone and just chat. Get to know them well. Invite them in. We want to know the food world. And he did that very well. He got well known. I assume you wanted him to be well known in media also. Well, the media came. The me when, when the how, how did, how did that happen? Did you do it consciously, or well, did, did the world beat a path? Well, I have to say, path? Brennan's had a pretty unbelievable PR history, especially in the mm -hmm. discovery. Of, I mean, discovery, especially in the beginning of Breakfast at Brennan's. Mm -hmm. The national magazines were just beginning to do that sort of thing, and we were a family, and they wrote them. I mean, it was Collier's, Sad Even Post. Uh, uh, Look magazine, life. 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 We got a little light, little bit in life. I mean, there was a uh, a story about wines, and I was considered the wine kid, so they brought me up there. And uh, one of the things that I have to say that happened in my early life, we, my brother introduced me at 21 in New York, mm -hmm. and that family adopted my family. The so my family adopted them. And the, the, that was the Krindler family? Krindlers and Burns, B-E-R-N-S. Mm -hmm. And those guys were so welcoming to my family. Uh, uh, I hung out there an awful lot. I mean, I'd go up to New York, be in their kitchen, mm -hmm. uh, be in their kitchen, back in the wine cellar, that fabulous wine cellar, at the front door, at the front door understanding what they were doing, who they were doing. And they were telling me who was in the dining room. And it was the top people in America. And they would t take me out to places. It was an extraordinary experience because I was very young. And uh, I'll never forget going to the opening of the opera with them. And then leaving there and going someplace for a snack after dinner. I'll never forget going This is when you were running Brennan's. Mm-hmm. In the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget going into the big, the big German restaurant, Luchaus, mm -hmm. and Mac Krindler, who I love, standing there and singing, Wunderbar. <laughs> Wonderful. He just, no, by New York, knew him and he was them. So, did did they have chefs? When yes. did the, when did the chef become a phenomenon well, in they, New Orleans? They had a lead cook who they called the chef. Yeah. They didn't have a chef. But, it, but in New Orleans. There weren't chefs. No. They were, as you said, they were cooks. No. And when did, who was the first chef? Was it? I don't know was, what, what happened and when was in the it? hotels, but mm -hmm. right here. So um, you had, 
Which which most say? of them, any kitchen you went into, there was never a chef. There was, I mean, you would know the guy. I mean, he was a cook that everybody knew. Mm -hmm. Somehow or other, we knew each other. And uh, uh, the all the cooks at Antoine's used to sit out on the sidewalk outside the restaurant, mm -hmm. and you'd pass by and you'd tell them hello, and they'd say hello to you, and that's where Jimmy Smith came from. He had been at Antoine. Mm -hmm. He quit. And they Man. were, they were, what, what different, what's the difference between a cook and a chef? Well, a chef. In New, in New Orleans has, terms. Well, I, I could think of him as having to uh, lead an orchestra. And the, the rest of it is has that role too, a great symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. The, you have to be able to put the whole thing together. And it takes, most people don't do that. I mean, they open a restaurant, and there's a kitchen in the front. And generally, if it's small, it works. But if you were trying to do what I was trying to do, uh, yeah. me, I, I have to understand there's a me in this. I mean, a we, we, we. Uh, the, uh, the chef bit, I, that's why I felt we needed, I knew about chefs, I had read every, cookbook written, I had read every book about France and all, and I knew, I understood that how the French put their kitchens together. And we needed that, and we did that. And uh, in other words, so I knew, I felt the needs why to do that, and that's when I had, I thought at least Emil has a culinary mm -hmm. background, and I had worked with the Swiss chef. Mm -hmm. Did you, you considered Paul Prudhomme a chef? No. You said he became a chef, or did he no. become a chef? I under... think Paul is one of the greatest cooks, mm -hmm. naturally, intuitively. Uh, he loved cooking. I mean, mm -hmm. it, was, it was in him. He, he, he can't help it. It just comes out. Yeah. And he has unbelievable tastes, teaches you how to taste and that sort of thing. Uh, but he, running the kitchen, I mean, he ran it, don't get me wrong, but he ran it like I ran it. out of. You know, his pocket. I mean, you know, but Emerald at least had culinary background, and he came in and he understood how to organize the kitchen. And Dick and he all, uh, immediately organized the kitchen. No, the kitchen was no. When Paul, yeah, when Emerald came is when we really did the kitchen. Let me ask. You, going back to what Howard Jacobs asked you, he, what did you tell him? That, I said, how that, that know, Nouvelle Cuisine was. I, think, uh, how, I don't know what you're talking about. I really don't. And, and, and I read the New York Times every day. And then you found out and you decided uh, you didn't want it. Is that right? Yes. Because it was a lot of these little boutique type, as I called them, uh, restaurants and chefs doing this in France. Yeah. Then the big chefs got involved. And it began to spread. Then it came to New York. And the next thing we were doing California food. And all of this is magnificent, but it's not here. And if you can be in business here, you can't do that. Did People anybody say, make it in New Orleans in that time as a not Nouvelle really, Cuisine? Not really. I, maybe Jonathan's mm -hmm. was more in that vein than any of the others. Now, I've heard, I've, I've heard you quoted as saying, using the term Nouvelle Creole Cuisine. We did try it, but, but we eventually forgot that, and it was Haute Creole. And Haute Creole. Are Haute they, Creole was about what we were trying to hang on our hat. Uh, we, so define haute creole. Well, haute creole is what I've been talking about. You take okay. classic dishes, you take New Orleans history, you blend it in with what you're trying to, what the, the lightness of the Nouvelle cuisine, the lightness of French cuisine, Creole cuisine, and make the food that you thought was New Orleans. And I promise you, it was exciting and extraordinary. I thought it came out extraordinarily well. We worked our tail off. No, but it, we loved every minute of it. In, in this, in this hard work, you, there was turmoil in the oh. in the restaurant business. But well, as you told me, there was well, also. We went in the restaurant business when we left Brennan's. We really didn't know how to make reservations. Today, our reservation system is marvelous, and we have no problem. Dottie tells the story about down at Brennan's one night. She took the, um, she said to me, I'm going to buy a green rope, like they had at the movie houses. Mm -hmm. She said, I gotta keep these people out of here. 
because we didn't know how to take reservations and we had the patio full of people waiting for tables and people wanting to come in. That shouldn't have happened. We shouldn't have abused people that way. But we didn't really understand how to make reservations. And But when we got up to commanders, now we're not stupid people, basically, but we were stupid about that. We finally started working and everybody that worked at commanders contributed something, whoever they were. They, they said, well, why don't we try this? Or why don't we try? So we were using all these people that were in the restaurant. I don't mean, I hope we weren't using them. I hope they were part of us. Mm -hmm. And they would say, well, let's try this, and let's try this. And eventually, we got the reservation system, perfection, 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 perfection. perfection. Now they're gonna come in with all this on, uh, online, and we take a little of that, I think, but if you call online and tell me you want a reservation, how can I tell you? I have to be able to tell you no. You know, it has. Yeah. You got to really work it into your system. So, so now that in the in this turmoil of learning of of coming yeah. up with the plan, packing the bar and not being having the seats for the people. Oh. But there was also term. You, you, I think you alluded to that there was turmoil in the city in the sense that there was just a lot of change and ferment. Oh, there was a tremendous in, uh, amount of change going on in the city. And Moon Landrew, you mentioned, I think Moon did a, brought a lot of change I think he was in, in the cultural and social he did. area, he did. And he particularly did. in integration. He, uh -huh. and by integ oh, pushing integration. Oh, he was phenomenal with that. How did, how did you see all that from the perspective of the restaurant? Well, let me tell you restaurant? a story I'll never uh -huh. forget as long as I live. I was at Brennan's and was toward the way into the 60s there. Well, two things happened to me. One day I turned around at the little office we had on the third floor, and I looked out the third floor windows, and the courthouse lawn was covered with hippies. It was like a week before Mardi Gras, or a week before Mardi Gras week. I couldn't believe it. It was a shock to myself. As I said, I read the New York Times every day. I was shocked. The other time, uh, I had something that I, when it, it was terrible. Uh, these people were invading the city in mass, and the integration thing was going on. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget this young man. And the invasion was the hippies. The invasion was the hippies. I'll never forget seeing the great uh, actress who I now love. What was his name, Danny? Cher. Cher. And Sonny, Sonny, Sonny and Cher walking on Royal Street, and everybody said to me, it's Sonny and Cher. And I looked at them, and I felt like saying, you gotta go take a bath. <laughs> I mean, they looked awful. So, uh... And they were kids. Huh? They, they, they were kids. kids. And I'm trying, and what, uh, I, oh, this man came in, and he's, one, he, I knew him, he was a very prominent family in New Orleans, and an attorney. And he said, uh, Ella, we have a Harvard club here, like, next Tuesday or something. And he said, and we're gonna have a black man with me in the party. One of our out of town graduates is coming in. And I said to him, I said, oh my God. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, we have a table we keep every day in our main dining room for the federal judges that are across the street. People bring them to lunch. And I personally know that some of the men that bring them, and I'm quite sure a couple of the judges would get up and walk out and make a scene in the dining room. Okay, and when exactly was this? Do you, can you remember? Well, we were at Royal Street. In the 50s. 60s. 50s or 60s? Maybe it was late in the 60s or something. And I said, and I think I thought a few people might follow them. I said, is there any way? The Royal Orleans was very, very new, and Jim Nasekis was managing the Royal Orleans. Okay. And I said, is there any way you could take the club over to the Royal Orleans? They've passed the law that the hotels are integrated. Would you mind going to the Royal Orleans? He was furious with me, absolutely furious with me. And I think I'm a way out liberal nut, okay? And he is furious with me. And I think he should know, I think he knew, I know his brother knew my political feelings was terrible, but I, that was true. And th that was going on in the city, the turmoil. And the judges were fond gentlemen. I mean, they had lovely families. 
the, the people were entertaining them at lunch. I mean, it was just the way it was. And Moon, they all disliked him tremendously. They didn't, they wanted him out, they wanted him out, they wanted him out. Now, I'm not picking on the judges, I'm picking on New Orleans. And Moon was fantastic. As mayor. As mayor. Yeah. He, I can look you in the eye and tell you, Moon Landry never took a cent from this city. Never a cent. Not even, I don't think he took a cab drive. He was fabulous. And God knows his wife, Verna, was right there beside him all the time. That brought New Orleans up to understand it. We could have some clean politics. Yeah. Well, they were, and they were to committed going. to they were committed integration of the cultural and social yes, they were. and business. They well. absolutely were. And he passed the, the the law you referred to was that the there was a public accommodations law passed when Mayor the city law. Ma yes, when Mayor Landry was in his last year on the city council. So well, it, was, it would it have was been sixty-eight. Last, 68. I, this, it wasn't in effect when I was telling this man to go, because yeah, yeah. we were all waiting for it. Yeah. We were waiting for some kind of a law that we could hide behind. That's what we're trying to do, hide behind. And uh, when, by the time we got up to commanders, we were able to welcome black people with mm -hmm. a blink of an eye. I mean, it, uh, Do you remember when the first black customers were reg regular at Brennan's? I can't recall that. Do you? I can't tell you that. I don't think it. I don't think they could have cared less about us. Mm -hmm. I don't think they were interested. I think, as I have learned as the years go on, I think those people had a wonderful life. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't have every legal right to come in and do everything that anybody can do. All right. But they had a lovely life. They were people who, number one, they ate as well or better. They would go fishing, hunting, crabbing, crawfishing go home and cook it in the wonderful New Orleans style and have the music to go with it. Now, I'm not saying that's an excuse for segregation, because I didn't think segregation was right, ever. My mother and father didn't think segregation was right. So I'm not, but I do believe that those people taught us a lot about the good life. Did, so then at Commanders, uh, by, by that when did you get, have uh, integrated parties or integrated? When, uh, uh, oh, uh, a lot of parties were integrated. I, and I mean, just when, were you, when was your dining room well, I visibly I, integrated? It started almost right when we started getting well known. Mm -hmm. We're getting a reputation being a good restaurant. Mm -hmm. These people would begin. So to you'd come taken in. over for, in, for a few years, and, uh -huh. you had and they were coming in. I'm sure, but I, when I really think of it, and I remember my sister Dottie. Yeah. Working the front door, as we call it, being so excited and coming back and saying, this, Go look at the ex wonderful people on table, so and so. Look how well educated they are. Look how well dressed they are. And these are African Americans? Yes. And, and you felt like you had to attract them by having a good restaurant and good food. Good restaurant and good food. And when they came, I want to tell you, we tried to be hospital, hospitable. Mm -hmm. Just the other night, I was sitting in the restaurant, and this young black man came in. Young black man, he was well dressed, and he had his child with him. And we wanted to make him feel comfortable. The first thing out of our minds, and we sent the child some balloons. And the next thing you know, you sent the gentleman some wine. You wanted to make him feel mm -hmm. comfortable. And when they got up to leave, they came over to our table, I was in the wheelchair at the time, and the little boy hugged me. And I, I just, that's the way I was that's brought cool. up. Black people come in our restaurant, and my sister Dottie makes a point of going to those people and welcoming them and talking to them and saying, do you live in New Orleans? Oh, it's so good to meet some of our neighbors. Or you're from out of town. We're so thrilled that you've come to New Orleans. We feel that, and we want them to feel comfortable in our dining room. Who were the? Do you, did Moon Landrew come to Commanders? Oh, all the time. Mm -hmm. We grew up with Moon. Dick and my brother Dick and Moon played on the baseball, baseball. team that went for the chair, the national what do you call it, the World Series of Baseball for kids when they were in uh, 
high school or grammar school. I don't know what. We've known him forever. And who did he eat with in, in Commanders when he was mayor? I don't know. I mean, he came with friends. I mean, uh, he, he frequently would bring uh, somebody from out of town that he had, to, he had to entertain. He was entertaining yeah. somebody from out of town, and he'd bring them to Commanders. He knew Dottie. Dottie grew up with him. She knew him very well. And uh, he, he was just perfect for New Orleans because he knew New Orleans inside and out. He was not on either side. He knew the, the elite, the aristocracy, silk stockings, whatever you want to call it. He knew those people. He knew the business people. He knew the black people. I mean, he played tennis with everybody. He was a very decent human being. Did he? Would he bring um, uh, integrated groups to your to Yes, the restaurant? I'm sure he did. If, if, if there yeah. was somebody coming down yeah. from Washington, or mm -hmm. there was somebody here he was doing business with in New Orleans on the city council or in the mayor's office, he would bring them. I'm sure he did. I can't pick out certain. Right. I mean, I just considered it the way it was. was uh, Commanders was um, uh, an attraction for political and business leaders? Uh -huh. For a long, yeah, a long yeah. time. And, and, you know, I know you Ruth had... Ruth took him away for a while. Who? Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Oh, oh they Remember, yeah. they all started gathering there. But Brennan's was always... Mm -hmm. All the political people were. And, and commanders, I promise you. They all were in and out of there. And did you and have... And they kind of hang, hang out together. You know, there'd be a table of eight guys that were in politics, you know. And over here, a couple of judges. Do you remember who they were? Oh, uh, Donnie, you can help me with the names. Well, that was your generation of the younger ones. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of judges. Uh, what were their names? I'm, I'm, I'm having, right. I'm 88 now, you know. Uh, well, you're remembering a lot more than me. So. Well, this is... Did Dutch Morial come to the restaurant? Yes. Not much. He came, I think, on parties. He came when he was invited. And I don't remember him coming, but his wife came a lot. Sybil. And did, Sybil they, did they come as guests or were they hosts? Well, Sybil would come with people. She'd bring people. They brought her. Uh, I'm having trouble remembering who, but Sybil was always in there. In fact, I remember going up to her table one day and saying, can we talk? And she said, what? I said, look, line yourself up to run for mayor. Please. We women have to do it. Mm -hmm. And you can mm -hmm. do it. I know you can do it. Please, and we sat down. We told her, "Well, I can't do it for this reason." I said, "Those aren't good reasons, you know." And we tried to persuade her. And and was uh, Dutch Morial in the restaurant before he was mayor or after he was mayor? During? I think it was after he was mayor. I don't remember him before mayor. And, and what about? I mean, so some, when he, when he was mayor, he yeah, was in the restaurant. Yes, yes. Yeah. What what about uh, the, the the the? They great mostly came, I think, like in the political groups. And why am I having trouble remembering their name? I think I can remember Chep's City Council. I can remember Chep's City Council, but I can't remember uh, uh, Mitch. No, let's try and think of that. I know they came in a restaurant. I knew them. I read the paper every day. I knew what they were doing. Why can't I call their names? City Council members? Uh -huh. I'm having trouble. Peter Beer, Eddie Saper. Oh, Peter Beer. That was a wonderful man. Of course, he was a good couple. Eddie Saper. Jim, yeah. Jim Singleton. Uh, Jim Singleton. Yeah, Jim Singleton came in all the time. All the time. Uh, Sherman Copeland wasn't on the council, but he was in the legislature. I don't know he's been in, but he was one of our customers. Uh -huh. Thank God. And, yeah. uh, well, I'm sorry, Daddy, it's the truth, uh, from my point of view. What about Norman Francis? Oh, oh we adore him. He's one of the great people of New Orleans. Um, and was he a regular at the, yes, he the came, from the early days he of still Commanders? Comes to yeah. Command. I mean, well, his wife's not well, I don't know if you know that. I think she has Alzheimer's. But he has always, always been a customer in the mm -hmm. Commander's Palace. And would 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 and And his wife Blanche. Would they uh, come for social reasons or for business reasons or both? Mostly entertaining. Yeah. Somebody, you know, he he had a busy job, and then and she was a great cook, and so when he got home, he he wanted to be home. He would come when he had somebody to entertain, and he would call in advance and tell us who he was bringing, and wanted us to understand and take care of him, and we were thrilled that he was doing it. 
Do you remember um, any restaurants that, in particular that, that uh, mixed, racially mixed groups in New Orleans in the 60s felt comfortable going? A number of people said it was hard to find a place where uh, they felt comfortable. Other, com felt comfortable going together and that they were welcome. And that Dookie Chase was was that one was one place woman, huh? and there one place and there weren't too many other examples. Do you? Well, I don't think there were. The the I'm tell, trying to I have to move. The customers understood. Everybody kind of understood. Like Leah Chase and I consider ourselves best friends. I mean, we do anything for each other and have, mm -hmm. have. And I've been to her restaurant many times. She comes to our restaurant all the time. Uh, but she will tell you there was a line. I read something the other day where she said, she was talking about how she felt very comfortable in the white community, but a lot of her people did not. They weren't able to, they didn't want to risk being um, snob, snubbed, what's the word? Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to risk causing any yeah. conflict. Was that then or now? I think it was more then. Mm -hmm. I think they know they're welcome now. I think they come whenever they want to. But I think there's a, still a line that these people live, not because of integration and segregation, but because of the way they live. They have their own lifestyle. They have their friends. They entertain. They go out. They have their parties. And sometimes the parties are at commanders. They frequently we have large integrated parties. Frequently we have ladies, four ladies at lunch that are all dressed up and look wonderful. Uh, it, but there's just I don't know. I don't know how to. I'm not capable of putting the words. Yeah. What, did you? Did uh, let me ask you about another group of people. The the business people. Did oh, you get? Well, you know. The bank presidents, oh, Lars Merrigan and Jimmy Jones, and oh, they were all our customers. And, and they would come on business for lunch and dinner. They'd come or? for lunch. They'd bring. They'd come for money in their office, or a friend, or a customer. Uh, they were always for lunch. They came lots of times for dinners. We were a big celebration restaurant here. Mm -hmm. uh, they celebrate anniversaries, birthdays, graduations. Yeah. Uh, and and, and was that happening right from the the beginning no, of your tenure? No, we had to earn that. Yeah. We had to earn it. They were going to Antoine's and Arno's, and we had to get on that list. How long did that take? Well, I think we were at Commanders a good five years before we felt we were beginning to arrive. Um, the these people that you that work for you, we named Paul Prunum and and uh, Emerald. and Emerald. Jamie. Uh, we had, but you had just a long list of other people. Kevin Vizard, oh, Vizard. And, Vizard and uh, Frank Brightson. And uh -huh. So you, you, how do you feel about it? I mean, these people were, were uh, alumni of your kitchen. Uh -huh. uh, did that, how do you assess that impact? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's going to sound phony. Mm -hmm. But we were excited when they learned and grew. We were trying to raise the standards of the Russian business. And we would, I promise you, I spent half my life sitting at the kitchen table talking, trying to, like I told my grand nephew who is coming around talking to me a lot now, he, I told him, I said, Harvard Business School always taught by the, uh, they taught the uh, what do they call that? The, the case studies. Case studies. Yeah. I said, that, I, that's natural to me. That's the best way I can know how to teach. I would tell them a story. I would tell them a story about celery. <laughs> you know. So that's how you ran your culinary school mm -hmm. for them. Uh, and, and without your kitchen, what would, what would New Orleans' um, restaurant world be like? Without our kitchen? Yes. Well, I never thought about that. I'm giving you a chance to brag. Uh, well, I mean, I think we were a major part of bringing New Orleans into the 20th century, and now we're trying very hard to do it now. We, we feel 
that the people that work with us uh, are rather special. Most of them, if they're not special, I'm damn well quick to tell them. Uh, we think they want to learn and we try to expose them to everything we know. My brother would sit there. My sister Dottie has been for years working with the, uh, the people that work in the restaurant. I could tell you some stories, but I won't tell them to you because it's not fair. But she has taken people and taken them shopping so they know what to wear. Uh, she has taken them uh, and say standing up and she straightens their coats on them. And These are employees. Yeah. yeah, she loves them. And then pats them on and she gives them a kiss. I mean, you know, she, we tried uh, to, you know, pat somebody on the cheek, cheek and kiss them if you don't like them. But they're not, most of them, when you give them half a chance, they immediately become wonderful people. And you, you understand each mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to work together. You know, you know, a lot of the things that happened in New Orleans in the 1970s, some of the things stopped. Like real estate development and high-rise construction on Poitras Street. If we had it in the 1970s and we didn't have it much after I that. remember Poitras Street way before yeah. that ever happened. Right. So to me that's very current. But, the, but let me ask you about the, but the restaurant business seems to have been uh, permanently changed by the 1970s. I think and, so. And keeps going on. I mean uh -huh. every, every decade since then uh -huh. and has I'll, added and to it. All I can tell you is What's happened on Magazine Street has been phenomenal. It's been very successful, and everybody goes to Magazine Street. I mean, they, they think of it as restaurant row, mm -hmm. most of them, you know, that sort of thing. I think they have not had as many restaurants that I think we consider, go, let's go out to dinner, ha open in Metairie, as have on Magazine Street. I don't know how many they are, but, uh, I don't think there are many we missed eating it. Yeah. And uh, like the night, I'll never forget this magazine in, in Britannia here, magazine in, Ma magazine in Washington, mm -hmm. was an automobile parts store. And the next thing I turned around, there was this bistro there. It's absolutely charming. And I go there whenever I get a chance. I like it, I'm crazy about it. They know us, we know them. And and in in the, in the 1970s, we started experimenting with having kind of a, a, a more uh, industrial strength tourism economy for New Orleans. We were a very big part of that. Yeah, very big part of that. And, and that's do you, do you see that as having grown steadily? Yes, uh, my brother yeah. Owen stood on the intersection of Bourbon and Bienville Streets. The restaurant was here, Absin House was here. He had bought the Absin House, and then. Mm -hmm. got us in the restaurant business. And he stood there and he said, if you can't sell New Orleans, you can't sell anything. This has got to be the biggest tourism city in the country. And Chet Morrison appointed him, well, listen to this, to be vice chairman of the vice commission. And Mr. Foster, Bananas Foster, Richard Foster, mm -hmm. was the chairman. And they were determined to build a convention and tourism business in New Orleans. It didn't go as well, it was slow to move. Chep pushed it like crazy. Uh, he, they, they put, we, my, my brother's dead by this time, on the front porch of my family house had this big group of people all in the tourism, hotel, restaurant business, and said, we're gonna move the Tourism and Convention Bureau out of the Chamber of Commerce. Now, our big job is not to make the Chamber of Commerce anti. We have to do things that make them feel we will still be a part of the Chamber. We will pay our dues, we will attend. But the Convention Bureau has to be a concentration of effort to promote this city. Now before that, my brother was alive. As far as I was concerned, there were five hotels in New Orleans and none of them first class. Because by this time, I was being sent all over the country to learn 
and I got to learn what a first class hotel was. I'm gonna tell you this story, Seymour Weiss. Every time somebody would come to New Orleans. Of the, of the Roosevelt Hotel. Yes, the big chains, the Hilton, the, or the, it was Sheraton in those days, would come to New Orleans. And he would take out his plans how he was gonna expand the Roosevelt. And he would do them from being on the board of the Hotel Association of America, and they wouldn't come. And Chep was going out of his mind and was trying to get this Tourist and Convention Bureau going so that we could begin to get past Mr. Weiss, who was a charming man, but he was a hell of a competitor. And that was very, very hard to get the first hotel here. And we eventually, uh, who was the Sheraton? Uh, the, the, they bought the uh, St. Charles Royal Hotel. Orleans, of course. Huh? The Royal Orleans, of course. Of course, well, that came a little bit later. There was a Sheraton. Yeah, I think the Sheraton was in the St. Charles. Yes, I yeah. think so. That lovely old building. You remember that? Mm hmm. Oh, it was a handsome building. And they took over that. And they, then they built a, a hotel. And by degrees, there was a man running the Kirsten Convention that had worked for Chep. He was one of his guys. He put him in there, his name was Glenn Dalsett. We became very close friends. Glenn worked his tail off for no money. A clerical job, I mean, uh, I don't want to say, put him down, but he was a dear friend and I know he didn't make a lot of money to run this bureau. And it was, eventually, we, it was in the, on Royal Street in the uh, American Legion building, which is now a police station, or I don't know what mm -hmm. it is now. And they finally had to move, so they got an office in what is now the, the, big, the, the courthouse building. Mm -hmm. And they were right across the street. We got to know each other, we got to know the bureau people. Very well. And as I said, on my front porch, we had all the hotel, not the hotel, the restaurant people, people interested in tourism, and we were able to take it out of the chamber and concentrate on it. Later on, Lester Kavikoff, who was Gloria, his wife, went to high school at the same time together in the street car. We knew each other. We would have dinner together. A lot, I mean, we were friends. I was very close friends of Glenn's and I was very close friends of Cabby. Cabby came in and took over, Glenn was out. And Cabby started this wonderful tourism birth of New Orleans. I'll give him all the credit in the world. He really was, he got money. So what he did, Glenn didn't have any money in the, in the bureau. Mm -hmm. Chep, I mean, Cabby didn't know how to get money. And I never forget, there was a parking lot where the Royal Orleans is now. And uh, Cabby came over one day to talk to us. We had lunch together and he said, we're gonna build this hotel. The Stern family, mm -hmm. Cabby, and uh, uh, it's gonna be here on the corner and we're gonna have a garage. It'll be great for you all, we're not taking your parking lot away. We'll have a great garage. And there came the Royal Orleans Hotel. We were investors, very small, but we invested in the hotel. And uh, Edgar Stern, uh, his mother, of course, Edgar, and a bunch of New Orleans citizens put up money and built the hotel. Uh, it was unbelievably beautiful and well done. It was Terrific. And that was at the beginning of the, the, the hotel boom in in yeah, it was really from the because we, I said we had like had a share. Maybe right before they opened the after I, maybe it was I think it was I can't tell you the Hilton. Cabby was big part of getting the Hilton mm -hmm. over where it is on the river. Uh, we did, started getting money for the Tourist and Convention Bureau, and tourism began began to happen. But I remember it from day one and love the idea of how the city worked together, finally got these hotels built and 
This is his results. And could, could. Um, like I'm trying to put it in the seventies yeah, for right. you. Well, could could Brennan's and and uh, commanders later have uh, survived without the tourists that were coming increasingly? Not as well as we have. Yeah, I don't think so. We uh, we did breakfast at Brennan's. It was almost except for Sunday. Sunday was all local, mm -hmm. but the rest of the weekend when we first started breakfast at Brennan's, we only had we only served the first four from twelve is what. For eight. We had eight tables that we opened for breakfast at Brennan's on weekdays. Eventually we used the whole building. But we struggled because we knew there were tourists in the city, but there weren't that many, and they were coming here for other reasons, and they never heard of Brennan's. And so we built breakfast at Brennan's. We came up here, by the time we came up here in 74, believe me, conventions were moving. The city was building. I think we had built the, uh, what's his, you know, his building, uh, Davis, uh, the architect. Arthur Davis. Arthur Davis. They had built the, uh, that beautiful building that they threw it at, the conventions, the first convention. Oh, yes, the Rivergate. The Rivergate. Right. That had happened uh -huh. then. That was early. That was very early. And what a wonderful building. Mm -hmm. So sad that they tore it down. But, uh, that was all happening back in your 70s, in the hotel business. And when did you, the, what was the, the clientele for commanders? Uh, was it local at first? Was it well, local and, and tourism mixed? Um, it was mostly local in the beginning, as we developed the local people. And then we began getting good national publicity. And we, th I thought it was rather phenomenal that we got all this publicity up there. Uh, it just so, and that brought in more oh, non-New or New Orleanians. Well, yes, it brought both. Uh, we still consider ourselves the first person we're going to take care of, and coming in that door is going to be New Orleans. And we do everything to tell them, say you're from New Orleans when you call up. Don't let us tell you we don't have a table, because we save tables for the locals. We always do. I mean, if you call me at eight o'clock on Saturday night and say give you a table. Uh, because we hold back. Because mm -hmm. you can, you know why? Because there's enough business in the city and you can fill them late. So you can hold them back. That's good. Listen, before we totally exhaust you and. I am. I want some water. <laughs> Do you want, well, you, why don't you, do you want a break? Or I, I wanted to give Justin an opportunity to ask some questions and. and uh, unless, unless you. No, I unless think I'll tell you everything Unless I we're overtaxing you. It kind of went, it was good for a while and then it sort of changed. And there, there was uh, the great Chinese restaurant. Oh, Jin's? This, the Jin's, mm -hmm. on Kantai Street. I mean, it was a hole in the wall, but it was packed with the Williams people. It was great. Uh, help me, Diane. How do you remember all those restaurants? Do you? I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to go ahead and, and keep this recording. I'm going to keep this because these are something that things that are actually very yeah, interesting yeah. to me. Do you remember a restaurant named Misera's? On Miss Paros. Miss Paros, but Miss Sarah's. It no. was the. It was a Miss Paros. The, the Nut Club Bar. And it Nut became Club. Segretto's. And then it I became, remember Segretto's was on Bourbon Street. Right, Bourbon and St. Louis. Was, well, it, when it first was there, it was right near Gallup was. Uh, right. right. It, well, that's where it where was first. Tercy's, where uh, yeah. Tercy's was. I don't remember that. I remember Segretto's. Yeah. And then. Uh, and then, because I'm, I'm, I'm writing about all these right now, and uh, it's, it's unusual. Well, uh, it's, you bring them back to me, I'll tell yeah. you that. Well, there's a restaurant at eight where uh, <coughs> Segretto's moved, <coughs> and then Moran took over. Oh, yes. Jimmy Moran. Now, Jimmy Moran, well, that was La, La, La Louisiana. But he had. No, but he, before that, he had a bourbon, a house, on, a restaurant, one of the side streets right near Bourbon. Yeah, um, and when he was Jimmy Moran, he had the diamonds and yeah. the diamonds and the meatballs. Yeah. Uh, I was in right. mm -hmm. Shall I sit there? Yes, yes. Right. You, you need this. Uh... Now, part of our group always you, uh, was a lot of the people on Bourbon Street. What? what and I say Bourbon Street. I, I'm, I'm immediately thinking Pat O'Brien's. Pat mm -hmm. and what was the other man's name? Uh, see, I mean, I knew that man quite well, but. 
Maceras would have been, their timeline was 1885 to 1944. And then. Well, and then Joe Segreto's dad, well, he yeah. who was actually yeah. Joe, so not Joe Southern. Segreto and Dottie, Joe Segreto worked at Brennan's and Commanders next to Dottie for years. Yeah, yeah. They're like brother and sister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We go yeah. down there all the time. And, and his father, of course, was the one who had Segreto's restaurant. And, and he was Here, there. They had, uh, Tercy's was down there in the 200 block. Yeah, I'm, I'm vaguely pulling Tercy's. But that was right when they moved over to I think Poitras. Tercy's was on the river, on the Riverside Street, wasn't it? Uh, you know, I think they may have been on the lake side. Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, but this is what it was yeah. a very long time ago. Yeah. And then, um, and then it was Tosca's for like a year. And then uh, uh, Joe Segreto moved to Macera's location, which is the 809 St. Louis, just right off of Bourbon. Yeah. And then I remember that. And then, in 1947, Jimmy Bricado Moran. Took over the management of that I restaurant. I remember that. I remember Jimmy Moran. I promise you. What kind of man was he? Uh, wonderful, yeah. uh, theatrical, uh, 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 very proud of his background with Huey Long, and all of that history. Uh, he obviously was an Italian and grew up in a great Italian family. It cooked well, and he tried to do that in his restaurant. The meatballs were. Very big thing. They had diamonds in them. You know that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember eating there. I remember meeting him any number of times. I don't think he would say we were friends, but we certainly were friendly acquaintances. Uh, I was a kid, and uh, but it was uh, he was a great, exciting part that had gone out of my mind totally. And when they brought it up, it was a big part. I'm sure if you say ask me about some others, I most probably will remember them. Well, how about Elmwood Plantation? Was Elmwood Plantation oh. a significant restaurant in, well, in your Clay mind? Well, Clay Shaw lived in Elmwood Plantation. Oh, I didn't know and that. And when he moved, or they, he was renting it, I think, or they, he had to leave, whatever, they opened this restaurant. And uh, I had been in it at Clay's house. Clay was a dear friend of mine. Yeah. He, extraordinary human being. I remember going up to the house, wherever he lived, we'd go for dinner. And at this point, he was living at Elmwood, because he moved a lot. He'd buy these houses and renovate them, and boom, boom, boom. You know, you almost thought you had to go down Bourbon Street and say, Clay, Clay, where are you? We're coming for dinner, where are you? Because he was constantly moving into a different house. So he was at Elmwood. Then these people, I can't remember, I think they were part of the uh, Italian, uh, large Italian group of people. Right. Uh, it was said mafia. I'm not. They have no idea whether it was or not. Mosca's is a great restaurant that everybody loves. Di just recently has been out there a couple of times. Uh, but Elmwood was very good. We loved going there, and we thought of it as a quality restaurant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Italian people are all over this place. And marvelous. I, I wanted to ask you uh, some questions as a, as a business person. We've heard in a number of these interviews about how banking in New Orleans could have been more progressive in the 1970s, and that there were there were people in New Orleans who really wanted to to expand lending and and mm -hmm. and, and extend credit to business ventures, but that the banking, banking community was, was yeah. very conservative. It was, it was. As a restaurateur, did you run into this? Well, I have to say that. Uh, my brother, I remember this exact statement. He said, we cannot bank with the Whitney. We have to help another bank get started. And there was something called the Louisiana Bank. Gene McCarroll was president. And we banked there. And that progressive, maybe 10 times later, we're still there. But it's, I think it's, I can't call the name of it now. Uh, Donnie, what's the name of our bank? Chase, Manhattan, no, not Manhattan. What's the name of our bank? Bank, Chase. Chase mm -hmm. is what it Chase is now. Bank, yeah. But it started it's with Morgan's. a small group of people. Uh, All right, my brother might have invested $10 in it, you know. He became very friendly with the board, and uh, they were very good customers in our restaurant. But banking, he said that to me. We can't bank at the Whitney. 
because they have a monopoly at his mine, uh, and we need to have other bankers come in. And that was stifling to business. That's what he thought. And uh, the people that banked at the Whitley thought it was the greatest bank in the world because they felt that they could go there, and if you were an honest, hard-working person, you'd get along. Was so the, the Whitney wasn't bad. It was just the only bank. Was the Whitney reluctant to, invest, to extend credit to restaurants? I don't think we ever asked. I don't really know that. But it, 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 I, it, so many people go in the restaurant business with no money, and I would say yes. I think they, uh, I think they, you would have to have some collateral of some kind. I remember that word collateral, you know, and it generally was a house you owned or buying or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in um, uh, the NFL comes along. Right uh, uh, in the in the late right in, in the, 1960. How how did the New Orleans becoming an NFL town affect being in the restaurant business? It's fantastic. Now, if you think selfishly about it, they played football on Sunday, and they took some of our business to the football games. But they brought so much to the community that she didn't notice that, and it didn't last very long. The business came back. They, and I don't even know that it was a mom. We were scared of the NFL football games being like on a Sunday. We wanted them. We had to, we bought the tickets, the first people to buy the tickets. But uh, it was wonderful for the city. And I remember all the NFL men, I'm trying to remember, I remember that wonderful Mardi Gras when we had two or three of them join our family crew at Mardi Gras, uh, what was his name? And he eventually brought, remember that magnificent movie star? Uh, Ava Gardner into the restaurant one day. I can't remember his name. Uh, he, he, was, he was the lawyer, the chief negotiator for the, for the NFL. Well, I can't remember his name. Anyway, he was a delightful guy. And I was, when I was thinking of Ava Gardner, I was thinking years later. But, uh, they came in mass. What was that man? He was an ex-football player, and they called him Lucky Somebody or Footy Somebody. He had been with one of the universities, and he was he had a nickname like that as a football player. Can't remember. He was with the NFL, and they literally took our business over. Did they? I mean, bring they a came lot of, in in mass, you know. Did they bring <laughs> a lot of star power to the? Did you start seeing more celebrities dining in New Orleans restaurants when the NFL came to town? We. I don't know that the NFL has anything to do with it. I know that United Artists had a man named Addie Addison. Addie Addison was a local man. And that was the time when they started, movie stars were going on the road, it was before television, and they would go to each city and try and get radio and newspaper advertising. And Addie was, I mean we knew a lot of them, but Addie was the one that we do the best. And, and we know to cook pea soup, Addie's coming tonight. It was, uh, The radio show, What? The radio show that we had. Oh, we had a radio show, did I tell you? A you Brennan's know? radio show? In the restaurant. In the restaurant. On Bourbon Street, we started with it. Jill Jackson was on Friday nights. And she broadcast, but she, she didn't broadcast in the restaurant. She was sitting at a table. And she would talk about who was in the restaurant what was going on in New Orleans, and she interviewed one of the customers, and she had a daytime radio show called Hollywood something or other. And she would bring, she'd invite those movie stars that had been on a radio show into the restaurant for the nighttime radio show, and we'd all wind up having dinner with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, from Leopold Stokowski to, uh, I'm seeing over my shoulder at that table, looking in the window, Tommy Dorsey, uh, everybody. And they'd come for Jill's show. And they'd do their show in the daytime, and then they'd come down to Brennan's at night. And I mean, it, it's hard for me. Dottie will tell you, some of our oldest friends, I mean friends, I'm not talking about cancer, were these people on tour with Hollywood. And they would come, and you'd get to know them. And then they'd come back, and you'd get to know them. The next thing you know, they're in town with their wife and children, and you get to know them. And I'm talking about people like uh, uh, Robert Mitchum, 
I'm talking about people like uh, uh, our, our dear friend, uh, the one we adored. Uh, I love Mitch. Mitch was a hard, smart guy. He was fun to talk to. Uh, Danny Kay. Huh? Danny Kay. Oh, Danny Kay all the time. When he was learning to fly jets, he would fly in the New Orleans for lunch. <laughs> Stay for dinner, you know, crazy. Dance all over the street, you know, that kind of stuff. One, Raymond Burr. Raymond Burr. Oh, God, he was. He became a member of the family. He was, he would come for Thanksgiving. I mean, that kind of stuff. Uh, all of us movie stars were in and out of New Orleans. And it was the beginning. You, you know, I'm trying to remember all this, but it was the beginning of a lot of New Orleans becoming the city that we think it became. And people would love to come here. And it became easier and easier, I think, to sell to tourists and conventions. I'm trying to think of all the movie stars. I mean, I, 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 there's so many. Well, last night we talked about Clara Colbert. Yeah. I mean, you know, they came. And, uh, Lillian Hellman. Who? Lillian. Oh, Lillian Hellman. Well, she was from the, she wasn't a movie star. She just wrote for the movie. She wrote books from the movies. She lived here. I mean, her family lived here. Uh, she came down. One time she came down to do a, a thing at the public library. And we had her for dinner, like, almost every night. And she came to my home, our house one night and cooked red beans and rice because she wanted to show us really how to do it. She was quite a character. I loved her daughter. Uh, I'm just trying to think of all these people that came through. Phil Harris, of course. Oh, of course. And his wife. Right. Alice she Faye. sang for us one night in the lobby. That was a lobby bar in the Royal Orleans. And she stood up there and sang for us. And we gathered people from all around. Louis Armstrong. One night, I can't go into all this kind of stuff. Maggie Ettinger was one of the top PR people in Hollywood. I learned the word what PR was from Maggie. She was another one that adopted me. She came to New Orleans, and the first show was a comedy hour. And it did not have, I mean, it was live. They, they didn't tape in those days. And they did it. They were going to do it in Antoine's, but she met my brother Owen. And they did it in the intersection of Bourbon and Vienna Streets, where you could see the Absent House and the restaurant signs. And when Louis Armstrong, who else was there that, um, which a couple other movie stars, Peggy Lee, and there was a third movie star. Uh, I think he did uh, Oklahoma on the movies. Um, anyway, when Louis came in there on Sunday afternoon, we went up and stood on the balcony of the restaurant. And when he went there to practice, and he played way down yonder in New Orleans, the people came like it was Mardi Gras. From three stacks, you know, they come across the street, down the street, down the street, and they all surrounded him. And that man played, and there wasn't a dry eye in the crowd. He was home, and he was playing. It was phenomenal, one of my greatest memories. Well, you were talking about it before. Please, that would be great. Well, there was a point where he was in and out for a brief thing. Maybe he was doing a commercial, if I remember correctly. And uh, he couldn't stay in a hotel. Now, there were a lot of people around the Negro community that put him up. But this particular day, I think it was only one night, I don't remember. We had an apartment above the Alston House, and he stayed there. And I remember I was going around. Louis Armstrong here. Louis Armstrong. We adored the ground he walked. As I say, I'm not going to the saloon in the sky if Louis's not there. Another occupant of that apartment was Lucius Beebe, right? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Tell and me. Ray, uh, Robert Ruach. I don't know if you know Robert Ruach. He was on the cover of Time. I'll tell you a story about that. Sure. I'll tell you a lot of stories about Lucius Beebe. He's an interest. He's somebody who I've gotten very interested in. Have you read his books? I, I have read Lucius Beebe Reader. Okay, well, then you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. He'd come into New Orleans in his private railroad car, and he would invite us over to dinner the first night. And he had this big dog of St. Bernard named T Bone Towser. This big dog was there. You know, it was a, you know, we're in a rail car which was beautifully furnished. It was a wine cell, Turkish 
Turkish bath, some kind of hot bath. The kitchen was terrific, and we'd sit down at this very, very ornate formal table and have dinner. And frequently, when he didn't bring, and he came to New Orleans a lot, when he didn't, went on the train, I only remember him bringing the train that I, I can name three times. But other times he would stay in the apartment at the Absinthe. Now this man was used to utter luxury. The Absinthe apartment was not utter luxury. But he loved standing out on the balcony, smoking, looking at the crowds, looking at the quarter. He just was a fantastic man. And he helped us very much. I can't, am I boring you all? Mm -mm. Not at all. It's terrific. Lucius was, was in town, and he was having lunch at our first restaurant, Bourbon Street, across from the Absinthe. And he had been very kind to me. Some rather he had sort of come be with me, come be with me. So I was sitting with him. My brother Owen came in. We were sitting there, and we were talking. And Lucius had been very kind to me. He sent me books. He would tell me, read this. He would call on the phone and say, you, have you read this? He was writing for Gourmet at the time. Mm -hmm. and that's how I got my subscription to Gourmet. He told me about Gourmet magazine. And we're sitting there talking and talking, and uh, Owen is talking about the fact that Mrs. Kais had just written Dinner at Antoine's. And how are you going to compete with that? We're a new restaurant trying to get going, but geez, dinner at Antoine's comes out, they pack it in the Antoine. And uh, so we're complaining to Lucius about this. Of course, Miss Kais was a customer, I have to tell you. I know how to pronounce her name. It's Kais. She told me so. Uh, so we sitting there talking, and Lucius was talking about the fact that he liked he was beginning to like to eat in the middle of the day. He was thinking about, instead of dinner, he, he enjoyed eating in the daytime much more. Go to some place 12, 1 o'clock and have a great meal. We're sitting there talking, and we're talking about how we're going to get our foot in the door. How are we going to get going? And he said to, uh, he said, he started talking about this mid midtime meal, and Owen said, somebody brought up, I don't know what it was, it was a radio show named Tom Bremerman's Breakfast with Tom Bremerman on the radio. And Owen said, Breakfast at Brennan's. And he said, right there, God damn it, they can eat dinner at Antoine's and they eat breakfast at Brennan's. And that's a true story. Lucius Beebe was sitting there, and when we started talking about writing the menu. They actually said, write a menu for breakfast to me. And I said, oh, a breakfast menu? Okay, what do I know about breakfast? And he said, okay, you're not going to find breakfast in restaurants, but you're going to find it in the best hotels in America. Now I want you to go. I want you to come be with me in San Francisco. I want you to go to New York to the Palace Hotel in the Plaza. And I want you to go to the Connaught Grill and the, what was the great old, uh, the big old hotel in the river? One kind of a line right now, in London. And I went and ate and collected the menus. With Lucius Beebe? No, he sent me. He told me where to go, where to eat, and what I was looking for. Brought all the menus back, and we said, we don't want to serve this in New Orleans. This isn't New Orleans food. And Paul Bonger, who was our chef at the time, but he's no more chef than I was, was sitting next to me. Great cook. Oh, fantastic cook. He, we called him our chef for years. He had two books that were covered in um, the paper you, we used to cover our school book, butcher paper. And he the old books. And he said, come with me and we'll talk about eggs. And he opened this book on the egg page, pages, and I'm reading all these egg dishes. <sighs> okay, so, and then it started talking about other things. So we got into this cookbook, and this, his background was he'd come over from Holland, of all places, 
Holland. We changed his name to Blanchet instead of Blanche. <laughs> we put an accent on it and he became Paul Blanchet. So we're talking about these dishes, which were, I guess, originally, a lot of them were either English or French, but mostly French. But book cookbook was in England, English, but it was printed, oh, I mean, like, maybe before 1900. I'm not positive about that, because somebody stole the books from me. They're gone, they were stolen. They weren't barred, because they never came back. Hmm. And I used them for years and years and years. Paul and I sat there, and he cooked the dishes. And then we got into cooking things with calves liver and cooking things with, I remember, eggs a la Turk, which were cooked eggs. I'd never seen eggs cooked like that in my life. Uh, I think they called them curried eggs. Can't remember that. Wonderful dish. The yolk was hard, and it was, he made a dark sauce, a brown sauce, mm. espanol type base with, uh, and so we've been writing the menu <laughs> from those cookbooks. And Lucius had been there the first day. Nobody tells that story, but that's a true story. Lucius is one of the first people to write about Commander's Palace. In Holiday Magazine. Remember that? That, mag that magazine? Seen it. Full page picture on Bourbon Street in the upstairs little room which used to contain the air conditioning units. And we took them out and we put red flock wallpaper on a wall. We didn't know any better. We tried to make it look like Lucius's real car or something. And we had breakfast, we had breakfast in that room and they took pictures. Let me tell you this about those pictures. They asked I want to get two models. The one, the man in tuxedo and the woman in green, green, especially if it could be a long, elegant dress. Elena Lyons was a big part of New Orleans, one of the most fabulous characters ever lived in New Orleans. First of all, Owen called, what was her name? One of the girls, she was a debutante type. I can't call her name now. Her, her husband eventually wrote a column in the state's item. I can't remember the names, okay. So Owen called her and he said, would you do this picture? Would you come tomorrow morning at da 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 time in a ball gown? If you got a green one, that's what they're looking for. Robert Merrill was in town. That's another member of the family that died a couple of years ago. The opera singer, he was in town doing a concert. So Owen called him up and said, can I have this picture done for Holiday Magazine tomorrow? Will you come over? He was staying at the St. Charles Hotel, I'll never forget. And he came over and he didn't have a tuxedo with him. Why wouldn't he have a tuxedo? He was doing a concert. He must have been in an opera because he didn't have a tuxedo or tails with him. So Owen went got home and got his tuxedo. I don't think they rented them in those days. He had to go home and get his tuxedo and bring it over. And he had, we had to tie it in the back because Meryl was thinner than Owen. We had big, big safety pins, you know, in the back, pinning him up. Elena comes in this magnificent green, flowing to the floor, evening dress, and she was she beautiful. Was she yeah, was gorgeous. She, she, was she was just one of the prettiest women. And Meryl was just a smashing, smashing human being, full of fun, full of love. They take the picture, and it's a full page in Holiday Magazine. My brother Owen was a hell of a PR man. I didn't know he was a PR man. But he was a hell of a piano. It was born in him. He didn't learn it, it was in him. And when he met Maggie Ettinger, the lady from Hollywood that they came and told him, they fell in love. Well, I fell in love with her too. She was phenomenal. And he, she, she would say to him, I want to go to places you won't take me. And there was a cab driver that parked him across the street from the Yapsen house. Slim was his name. And he said, Slim, take her. And Slim took her to all the places, cheap, run-down, shoddy places that I was afraid to go to, but she wanted to go to. And the, the publicity that, the knowing how to sell New Orleans came from these people. Owen met them all, and they went away selling New Orleans. Oh, you all got stopped. This is ridiculous. I'm having... Uh, 
memory lane, down memory lane here tonight. Mm, 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 mm. Well, let, me, let me flip over my page. Maybe I'll have different lanes to go down. Um, the foodies, when they met in the kitchen, uh, when we, your foodie group. Well, we most, mostly met in the patio. Met in the patio. And uh, or if the weather was right, we'd go sit. Yeah, on my, my ear. Oh, you got a camera on? We do, now. but it's it's okay. I'm, I'm gonna mean, take my earrings off. I think that's Set. perfect. Tell my sister Dottie they hurt. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll, my earrings. I'm taking them off. They hurt. Oh. Uh, where are they? Uh, the foodies when you met and talked about. Oh, we sat down at the table and yeah. we would. The first thing we'd say. Anybody know anything new? Anything going on? Anybody have anything they want to talk about? Well, one of the things that's interesting to me is you traveled all over the world looking at restaurants. No, I didn't go all over the well, world. Well, all the I great... I Spain, Spain, France, and Italy. Mm, the Western. A little bit in Switzerland, huh? The Western world. Yeah, the Western world, right. And you sampled a great deal of cuisines, and then you came back here. But it sounds like there were a great many dishes that you enjoyed elsewhere that you knew instinctively would not play here. Classic French cooking is not what New Orleans wants. Let's use French pastry as an example. Okay. They don't generally use sugar. We're not going to sell that in New Orleans as a dessert. The people here want sugar. So the food, I'm trying to relate it to you on a similar level. The food was very classic. They had the classic sauces and ah. Uh, I mean, I would enjoy eating it, but I knew it wouldn't sell in New Orleans. It was too, I don't know the word, what's the word? It was too... Sophisticated. Well, it, it was certainly that. But the taste was very classic uh, French. Now, it, you go to these great restaurants, my God, the food was magnificent. Don't get me wrong, I would like to take those dishes and bring them over here and change them a little bit. I read all those cookbooks about the great chefs of France. I knew they were Russians before I got there. In those days, that, that was where you went. You went to the great restaurants of France, out in the country, down, you know, in, outside of Lyon, all those great restaurants. And the food was fantastic. Do you think the sophistication level of New Orleans diners increased between the time that the family bought Commander's Palace in 1969 and, say, the arrival of Emeril Lagasse about a decade later? Yes, because they were traveling. You see, after World War II, people didn't go to Europe much until, I say, the 50s. And they didn't go as often as they, eventually they went constantly. Everybody was going as fast as we could go. But there was a period there when they, had, they weren't traveling. And they weren't as sophisticated about food. I think the travel began happening and the publication of foodie magazines. Uh, cookbooks started happening, you know. There was always a few cookbooks in the past, but there were sort of stereotypes, and all of a sudden this thing was, was blooming. And I'll never forget uh, when I would go to New York. First, I think I did when that great big shrine, and those, what that's the name of it on mm -hmm. Fifth Avenue? Mm -hmm. And I'd buy every book in the place. And I'd have a suitcase extra to carry them back, because they didn't have them in New Orleans. I started reading about them in Gourmet. And then the other magazines started coming on. I'm trying to remember the names of them. But they would begin talking about cookbooks. And you were able to, the cookbooks were there, but they weren't in our local bookstores like that. Now, I bought every Louisiana cookbook that was published. You know, up the road, all the, the original Louisiana cookbooks. They were phenomenal. Did you, uh, did you ever go somewhere and then eat something and say, well, you know, maybe maybe we should try a version of this sure. back in New Orleans. All the time. And you tried it and it didn't work. Right. What were some of the more memorable... Let me memorable... tell you one of the fun things about yeah. that. Yeah. Paul and I were in the cookbooks. And 
I came up to Paul one day and I said, Paul, cook that. Now this is some French cookbook I have my hands on. And Pooks, Pook, Paul would say, it's in French. And he's got this Cajun French in his head. He doesn't know what he's right, reading. I don't know what I'm reading, it's in French. So he starts trying, he tries and tries. And we got, maybe we get somebody to interpret for us. Somebody walked in Russian and spoke French or something. We said, tell us this, give us this. And they tell you, I mean, it was a very friendly town. You know, you could ask anybody to help you and they would. So he cooks it and he says to me, what do you think? Look at this. I said, oh, mother. He said, we cook that every day. Can't remember the name of the dish. But that was the conversation. Cannot remember the name of the dish. It was the classic French recipe. And we cooked our version of it frequently. But we didn't recognize it as being classic French. Were you ever ahead of the New Orleans diners? Did you just put something on the menu that didn't work? I'm sure we did. Dottie helped me. I'm sorry. Put something on the menu that didn't work. What were some of those dishes? Well, there were, quite, yeah, there were many dishes. Uh, I can't remember. Well, what about the uh, uh, celebration dessert? <laughs> oh, gee. Okay. The celebration work. dessert was a classic French, uh, um, not a mousse, uh, the bomb. And I knew about bombs all, all my life. I'd ordered them in restaurants in New York and that kind of stuff. And we went to see this movie. <laughs> Betty Hoffman and I went to see this movie because it was called something about the great French chefs. It was a sort of a, maybe a mystery or something. I can't remember the name of the movie, but it was a movie. And we saw the movie and we said, that's it. That's the dessert we want. And we saw the tall, well, chocolate. tall, uh, I haven't lost the name again. Huh? Chocolate. No, bomb. And we, we went back to the restaurant immediately, made it, got out the books, made the rest, and had a mousse in the middle, and we had vanilla ice cream on the outside. And we made the ice cream, caught in a recipe, put the chocolate on the outside, and said, this is our celebration dessert. And we served it with raspberry sauce. Oh, we, we serve it, bring it to Nana, and make a, a raspberry out. A, sugar butter and a little liqueur of some kind, a little sauce to pour over. Well, the only freezer we had, we did, freezers weren't a big part of our life in those days. They are now. So we were putting in this freezer, I don't know what he, he used to keep bones and things for the stock pot in the freezer, I remember that very well. Because fr frozen wasn't in our vocabulary at the time. Even though you could go to a grocery store and buy frozen vegetables and ice cream, the rest of it wasn't part of us. So we didn't know how to do the dessert. How in the hell are we going to do dessert? So we moved the chef's table and bought a freezer and put the freezer in the kitchen, in this, put the bombs in this freezer. And then the freezer would melt. It would recycle, you know. It would recycle. And we'd have all this chocolate all over the place, which we immediately, as people would walk through the kitchen to go to the bar, would say, would you like a spoon? <laughs> it was, we were trying to get it out the freezer. Have some, it's a cup, have some. It was hysterically funny, but people loved it. Then the free, when, we, when the freezer worked, when it worked, it worked fine, but we never could figure out the cycling. We had every refrigerator man in town trying to cycle that refrigerator for it so that we wouldn't put the dessert in. At the wrong time. Sorry. And when, we, when it would freeze, you get in the diner, you couldn't cut it. You could have this, you finally wanted it with the chef's big knife. And it was hard to cut. The customers were crazy about it. We couldn't make it. We could not make it. We, we could make one and serve it to you, but we couldn't make them and put it on the menu. I was hysterical, it really was. That was an experience. That was it, friends. No, that was a commander. Mm -hmm. Who failed to adapt in the 1970s? Among your, your restaurant peer group, you, restaurateur peers, you, you said you were friendly with restaurateurs, but- Always, still to this day. Yeah, and 
who just didn't adapt well in the 1970s? Well, Jimmy Moran. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, I personally don't think Galatoire's did. Now, I love to go to Galatoire's. I love the Galatoire family. But they sort of had their stable, their set menu. And so did Antoine, their set menu. And they never changed. I would, if I'm going to go to Antoine's tonight, I know what I'm going to have before I go. Now, they're beginning to do things. I don't, haven't been there a while. But Yvonne, uh, Al Ciotar, who's owner of the restaurant now, and they're beginning to do things. I haven't been there. I don't think they've changed the major menu. It's in English, but I don't think they've changed it a lot. I love to go there. But I knew what I was going to eat before I went there. Now, we hope. We try not to have a dish that you say, you've got to go to a commander and eat this. We try not to do that. We try to have the menu every day prepared with what they would do. Like, for instance, the other night I went in there and I wanted to have a piece of fish. And it was prepared with melon and some other fruit. And I said to myself, never thought of eating this. I've got to eat this. What the hell is this doing on the menu? It was delicious. But I've never had that before. Sounds delicious. May not be there again for a while. I, uh, I've read some stories where there were these moments of doubt when you took over Commanders and were trying to transform it and you were running into difficulties and then you related the Collins story. But on the flip side of that, was there a moment when you know you finally had made it that Commanders was going to thrive? Well, that was a long time coming. I guess it happened. When we started making money. And Daddy said, when we started making money. When was that? I don't, when did we start making money? Huh? When did we start making money? Not soon enough. Not soon enough, Daddy said. Uh, I'll never forget Jim Villas, who's still alive today, living on Long Island, written a lot of cookbooks, came down here, and I had met Jim. I had known him, maybe he had been here before. Maybe my sister Adelaide had entertained him and they knew, they knew each other. And Jim called up, I knew Jim too, when I go to New York, I'd call him up and ask him to go, to go out to dinner with me, uh, so I knew him. And he called up and said, I'm coming down and I'm gonna do this uh, food story in New Orleans and I want a great story out of Commanders. And I said, well, come along. And he said, well look, First thing I want to tell you is I want to do a great gumbo story. I was like, okay. So uh, I called Miss Jill, who was our lady who purchased everything, and I said, Would you, Mr. Phyllis, I think you might have met him. He's been here a lot. I want you to put every ingredient that goes in the, goes in the gumbo on that table right there. And she did. And when he walked in, he said, okay, you got me. That's my vegetable story, huh? I mean, my gumbo story. I said, looks pretty good to me. And he took it out in the patio, took all the vegetables out in the patio, the day the photographer came. He wasn't there with him. And I think Paul was in the picture. I was thinking it was the first time Paul got national publicity, of certainly any merit. And I think that was the day, and I said, okay, we can do this. You know, we can make this restaurant not only as good as we want it to be, but as we can make it worthy of recognition. And we kept going. It was fun. Can you imagine doing that? Mm. That's great. fun. That's great. Um, I think, uh, I, I do have one last question about dress codes. Hmm. And the drift of dress Wait, codes. Dress codes. Dress codes. What, what did you say? He wants to know, the, what do you want to know? Well, I want to know, um, I mean, there's sort of a tug of war with dress codes for a while. It still is. Still yeah. is. Still still is. You, they'll stand at the front door now and say, I'm sorry, we can't serve you. I read on the outside of, uh, whose restaurant was it the other day? No, I saw it on uh, television. No, 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 you know, we, no, well, you have to get that explicit. Know. No shorts, no flip flops, no tank shirts, yeah. uh, no uh, hats on. No hats. You gotta take your hat off. 
I'll never forget my brother, my brother Dick walking in the main diner one day, and it's before we took the wall out. Yeah. So it was a long time ago. It's, there was a dude's table against the wall, and there was a man and a woman sitting in a man sitting there with his hat on. He had a coat and tie on, but he had a hat on, like a dress hat, you would call it. So my brother walked over to him and said, would you mind taking your hat off, sir? He looked at my brother like he was crazy and didn't take his hat off. But to everybody in the dining room had seen Dick go up to him. Dick's six feet three. And when he walks over to a table, you see him. The man didn't take his hat off. I read a story about Bill Cosby coming to Commander's Palace. I don't remember that. What was that story? About him wearing the coat that said CP on it. Yeah. Yeah, and there being well, a certain I mean, amount I'm, of mirth about it. I, I, we've asked them all what coats are. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, we yeah, had to. We thought what? People, we thought people wouldn't steal them if we put CP on them. <laughs> yeah, we well, wouldn't steal. They wouldn't walk out with them on. <laughs> They'd have the CP, maybe they'd send them back. You know, they were blazers. Yeah. And we all thought about, they like, thought they had their own coat on. Or something. And we lost many a coat. But the, the, the feeling always was, you know, New Orleans is the sort of city where you go out to have dinner. You go out to have, enjoy the food, enjoy your company, enjoy conversation. That's what New Orleans is all about. And to sit next to one of these, I mean, I'll never forget, my brother John was talking to one of the boys in the family who was going someplace, and he didn't have a coat on. And John said, you must be insane to go without a coat. And you should always have a blazer in the trunk of your car. My daddy used to say that to the boys all the time. And we had to have a skirt. Oh, I'll never forget when the pants Charles came along. And well, they are wonderful things for women. Look at me. Uh, you know, you've read all the stories about the skirts, but uh, the coats were the big deal, the very big deal. I'm trying to remember who, 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 any particular incident that we, you didn't know the people, because the New Orleans people came with coats. It was that simple. Didn't, they didn't think of coming without coats. But there were a lot of incidents at that front door. When people, you're insulting me and that kind of stuff. And you feel like saying, well, you're insulting me, but you, you couldn't do that. Poor Dottie faced it for years. Dottie worked the front door of the restaurant from the time you came back from San Francisco when your baby was born, was how many years ago? Uh, 50s. See, Dottie was the youngest in the family. And she got married and went to San Francisco for two years. Wasn't that tough? <laughs> and we sent her every week checks to go out and eat. Eat in the best restaurants in San Francisco and tell I us all about the it. Excuse that huh? Yeah, you should go to eat and get the menu and send the menu home. Sounds like a real cross to bear. Oh, it was a terrible cross. Yeah. What? But the coat situation, when California went casual, boy, that shook up the world because New York still. Well, Southern California was. All right, Southern not California. Not yeah, not San Francisco, Southern California. But the people, I mean, and the 60s were horrible. But those people, you know, they'd come in the front door and you just. You just have to barricade the door and say you can't come in. No, no, no. And she did. And what she frequently says, I'd disappear. I'd run up to the attic where our office was. She said, and let her face it. Everybody thinks Elle is this big, big, strong person. She's a. She says, I'm the biggest chicken. Any closing thoughts? I don't think I have any thoughts. What? I think I don't think I have any thoughts. On what? He said, "Do you have any finishing thoughts?" Oh. I said, "I think we've covered the waterfront, huh?" Well, thank you very much. Speaking of the waterfront, that's a pretty nice river out there. It's a great river. It's wine time if y'all like to drink yeah. a glass of wine. Yeah, you'll have wine, huh? Uh, the uh, yeah, Dottie. We'll all have a glass of wine. Yeah, <laughs> sure. sounds wonderful. Sure. And Dottie will go open some of our what we call house 